Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission Committee Day, Thursday, March the 21st, 2024. And I would let everybody to stand and join us in the pledge. Our new Director of Fisheries, Jason Henniger, is going to lead us in the pledge and invocation. Turn your attention to the screens. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Our Lord in heaven above, thank you for this day. Thank you for the wonderful resources we have in our great state. Lord, thank you for the, the staff, TWRA, and this commission. Lord, bless them with wisdom and guidance as they make decisions today that will <clears throat> have effects on, on your resources. Lord, we just pray uh, all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Jason's uh, our newly appointed director of fisheries, and we appreciate him doing the pledge today. Uh, okay, so our visitors today are Clarence and Laura Dye. And I informed them that they can only miss three meetings a year and they weren't here last month. So you got two to go. So uh, just keep that in mind. Brad Cohen. Thank you, Brad, for being here. Fred Moody, uh, Mike Butler with the Federation, Roger McMullen, and our most recent uh, Legacy Award winner, Anthony Landreth, is here with us today. Thank you for being here, Anthony. And uh, Brad Carrier is in the back with the uh, a Bill Dance hat on. So we appreciate you being here today, Brad. Okay, Miss Mary, would you please call the roll? Bonnie Ballou. Here. Brad Box. Here. Stan Butt. Here. Wally Childress. Here. Bill Cox. Here. Craig Davenport. Here. Chris Devaney. Ford Little. Here. Rhonda Moody. Here. Chip Saltzman. Here. Tommy Woods, Hank Wright, Here. Jimmy Granberry. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. And uh, we miss uh, Tommy. He had a conflict that came up unexpected. We miss Tommy joining us today, and we wish uh, Chris a speedy recovery. He came down with pneumonia this week, and we wish him a speedy recovery. Director Maxidon, uh, please. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Have a full house. It's always good to see a full house on season set time, season setting preview. So again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, let me just say that we are excited to see you serving in this leadership role. And Chairman, glad to see you there and excited to see what you're going to bring this year as we go through some, some issues that we take on this year. So thank you for serving in that capacity. March and April will be an important meetings for the agency as our wildlife and forestry vision present their season setting preview and the season setting recommendations on behalf of our agency. Since we were founded 75 years ago, season setting and the regulation of hunting and game species has been one of our fundamental missions. The thoughtful science-based regulations we have created over the years have reviewed big game species and actually revived many of these from critically low numbers to huntable populations that we get to enjoy now. The staff have reviewed public comments. They've reflected on the latest wildlife research and spent countless hours developing recommendations for you to consider today. The recommendations that you're going to see today also include the results of what we call adaptive harvest management. This is a plan our staff has been working with to implement for deer and turkey regulations for nearly two years. We appreciate the stakeholders who participated in industry focus groups to help develop the framework for what we're going to call AHM, the adaptive harvest management. And we appreciate Tennessee Tech University for their guidance in the process and the work to help develop this model for evaluating wildlife data that we have and applying it to the regulations. So this process is going to be critical for ensuring the sustainability of wildlife populations and habitats, and not only today, but for also for generations to come. It's fitting for us to have this conversation here at Buffalo Ridge, and you've got to enjoy some of the fruits of that this morning. It serves as our flagship outreach facility for the next generation of hunters. Uh, it's also a recruitment, a place that we use recruitment efforts to recruit folks into hunting and angling. So later this afternoon, you're gonna be hearing from our outreach assistant chief, Matt Clary, about the work that's being done here at the shooting ranges and other parts of the state. Last week, Matt also partnered with communications assistant chief, Don Crawford, to host another successful year 
of the National Archery and School State Tournament. Almost 1,900 students uh, participated in the tournament representing 99 schools. Central Magnet High School, Stewart's Creek Middle School, and Christiana Elementary were the big winners in their divisions. You can see some of the slides that are up here on the screen today. So for many of these young people, shooting sports can serve as a gateway into other activities like hunting and fishing. Even if it doesn't, they're still going to be learning a discipline and skills that come from archery. A big thank you to all the staff. There's many, several, I see several of the ones in here today that actually served to help part of that. We had many staff members that came from all across the state that volunteered to help at this event. And it takes a whole crew of folks to line itself for judging. And nearly every division in the agency sent volunteers out to help with this event. So today, we're also excited to welcome our newest member of the commission, Commissioner Ford Little. Ford is a Knoxville native and will represent the 11 counties in District 2. Ford is an accomplished attorney whose primary areas of practice include construction law, commercial lit litigation, and product liability. He's been active on several professional and civic organizations, and he's an avid hunter and angler. We're grateful to have him on board with us today and are confident that he's going to bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this commission. At this time, Chairman, I'd like to ask you to come forward. We would like to have a pinning ceremony for Commissioner Little and also make a presentation to him today. We have a pin that we give all of our commissioners. It's our Wildlife Resources Commission pin. If you don't mind pinning that on Commissioner Oops. Little for us. Okay, it went. Hey, I got another one. Lose the back of it, just the back. I'll just stick it. I'll just stick it in him real good. So he, did you find it? Yeah, we got it. No, this is a complicated task here. You gonna pin the new one on him? <laughs> just the new one. I got a big old fat finger. Sorry, guys. Last time you put on a corsage, Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> I gave up that a long time ago. There we go. Congratulations. Chairman also presenting with his resolution. You want to explain this? So this is his resolution. So as a commissioner, you have to go through confirmation hearings before the House and the Senate. And Commissioner Little was a government governor appointee. And this is a copy of his resolution where he got appointed. It's got the lieutenant governor, the speaker, and also the governor's signature on there. So congratulations. Congratulations, Paul. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my, my remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director, and um, for uh, the rest of the commission, we're working on your frame resolution. We think it's a great keepsake for you to to, to have. Um, we are celebrating our 75th year this year, Jason, and we're proud of that, and all the commissioners should have a pen um, on your desk, and anybody in the audience would like a pen, we're happy to share one with you. Another thing on the commissioner's desk, I've got a magazine that's got a great article about Ron and Fred in there. So I brought a hard copy so you could get autographs. So they'll be available, Fred, right after the meeting for, for autographs. And also, we're very proud of our annual report. So we have those available for anybody in the audience that want a couple extra copies. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a great thing that really tells our story in the past year and and what we're doing, and um, so we're happy about that. So today's committee day, and uh, we have a very robust committee system that we we, we use, and uh, you'll see that throughout the, the year on the different committees and, and all the different things that go on, and staff supports the committees uh, very well. So I'd like to read in the record the committees. Um, so our wildlife committee is Hank Wright as chairman, Greg Davenport as vice chairman, Brad Box, Stan Butt, Rhonda Moody, and Wally Childress are the other participants in that committee. <clears throat> Fisheries is led by Monty Ballou. Brad Cox, Brad Box is the uh, vice chairman. Bill Cox, Chris Devaney, Ford Little, and Tommy Woods are the uh, other participants. Uh, boating law enforcement, Tommy Woods is chairman. Monty Ballou is vice chairman. Chip Saltzman, Ford Little, Greg Davenport, and Bill Cox are the other participants. 
budget committee and bill does a wonderful job keeping us financially solvent bill cox is our chairman chris chip saltzman is our vice chairman chris devaney greg davenport money blue and rhonda moody are the other participants uh, our legislative and public affairs com uh, committee, which is a lot about this uh, document here. Chris Devaney is our chairman. Stan Butt is our vice chairman. Brad Box, Chip Saltzman, Hank Wright, and Rhonda Moody are on that committee. Retention, recruitment, and reactivation. Wally Childress, who just does a fantastic job with youth all across the, the area, with especially around duck hunting, is our chairman. Rhonda Moody is our vice chairman, Bill Cox, Tommy Woods, Greg Davenport, Monty Blue are the other participants. And the audit committee, Stan Budd is our chairman, Brad Box is our vice chairman, Ford Little, Hank Wright, Chris Devaney, and Wally Childress. So very, very uh, robust committee system with a lot of really good, smart people helping out with staff and what, what their needs are. So we're very proud of that. And so at this time, we got season setting as, as the director mentioned, at this time, I'd like to turn the proceedings over to Commissioner uh, Hank Wright, who's chair of our Wildlife Committee, to set the stage for this year's um, wildlife uh, season setting. So, Commissioner Wright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call uh, Chief Joe Benedict, please. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you for the uh, chance to come this morning. It's afternoon, rather. Um, we're excited to be here today as an agency. These are the probably the two biggest meetings that we have uh, regarding season setting. Um, as the director mentioned, this is a long process. Many of our staff are involved. Uh, I know the commissioners, many have talked to me and the directors and our staff about the ideas and thoughts they have. So we appreciate that input. Um, I had a few slides. I know we have some new commissioners that haven't set seasons before. And so obviously I'm not Wally or Mark. They'll come up after me. But I did want to just <clears throat> go through the annual season setting process. Uh, that we go through. Um, the hunting seasons are in the fall. A lot of our data collection occurs then. Animals that are harvested, some biological data off of those animals. Um, <clears throat> we collect these data uh, throughout the, the fall and the season. We have a period of an open comment period, if you will. Um, I've got some slides summarizing that input. Um, we really enjoy getting the feedback from the hunters uh, on what they're seeing and what they'd like. Um, so in addition to that, there are surveys that we do sometimes. We do a, an annual uh, deer harvest and effort survey, a turkey harvest and effort survey. So some in the last couple of years, as I mentioned, we have commissioner input in various ways. Uh, we compile the data, the harvest data, the biological data in the comments. We spend a lot of time as an agency uh, working through those comments, working through the data, providing summary, looking at what that might mean. Um, a lot of the times we're looking at more of a five-year average than what happened this immediate past year. Um, as we know, uh, hunters are fickle. <laughs> if it's pouring down rain on opening day, they're not going to go, right? If it's really, really cold, folks may not go. Uh, so we, we tend to look at a three to five year average uh, because as we change a regulation, sometimes it takes a while for the regulation to kind of catch up in the impact. It's Talk about all those data internally. We're here at a commission meeting. Uh, this is a preview meeting, as was mentioned. Um, no decisions will be made today. Um, what one of the other purposes besides presenting this to you all as informational uh, and to get your thoughts on these is to allow the public to watch the meeting, whether it's live or later on YouTube, uh, and hear the proposals that we're bringing to you and then provide comments. We'll open another comment period here uh, probably tomorrow uh, and ask for public input on the specifics of this recommenda these recommendations that we're bringing today. Uh, next month in April, we, the agency will present final recommendations to you all. Uh, first to the Wildlife Committee for their consideration and action um, and hopefully approval for most of those, if not all. And then uh, Friday, the full commission will vote. So at that point, the season setting will be done. And then there's a another monumental task that many of our staff, Emily's communication folks, uh, help with, and that's updating the hunting guide. There's a lot of details in the hunting guide, season dates, uh, the WMAs and all of that. So that's the next piece after um, the April commission meeting. So what's ahead? I've got a, a slide here. Um, we'll talk about Public input, as I mentioned, we've got summary, a lot of comments, probably the most public comments we've ever gotten around season setting. And you'll see the numbers are they're quite staggering. Um, again, a preview of the agency recommendations. No action is required. Uh, certainly, we'd love to have questions from you you folks as well. And then again, just a reminder, there's a we, we started a new process for deer and turkey uh, regulation setting or proposal development, I guess. Um, and again, we share this in January, I think. It's probably the most robust public input we've ever received uh, as an agency. And so that's something 
the folks that commented on. Uh, some folks came to public meetings, as, as Mark McBride, our assistant chief, talked about in January. Um, so what I've got here for you, I think this is probably my last slide before Wally comes up. I just want to run through the proclamations that we'll bring to you um, uh, today and then also next next um, next month in April. So good news. We've got two areas we'd like to establish as refuges. They will both have hunting on them. One is here in Region 1 at Holly Fork Creek, and then one is at Catoosa Ridge Refuge. Uh, we also have the Wildlife Management Area Proclamation. This is a very big proclamation. It outlines the hunting opportunities on our WMAs, our refuges, and our public hunt areas. Um, overall, these are increased opportunities. We've moved a few seasons here and there, and we're adding uh, different bag limits and things like that. We've also done a good bit of work on uh, creating a consistency in our regulations across WMAs, across the regions uh, that may have had slightly different wording but had the same intent, uh, and also uh, consistency uh, or simplification, rather, for the, for the hunters on those areas. We have a fur bear proclamation. It's really a simple change. Uh, you all passed a couple of months ago a new state um, listed species uh, proclamation, a new list. So we have two changes that we need to make in that proclamation uh, as a result of that change to the T&E list. Uh, take of raptors. Um, this body has spent a good amount of time with some uh, falconers uh, looking at the raptor take. Uh, there's some adjustments that have been made. Uh, we'll go through those um, Mark will Mark McBride will take over at this point. And then we've got migratory game bird season. Uh, this is not, there's no changes to this uh, except the calendar dates. There is some uh, discussion that Mark will lead you guys through about um, where you guys might want the seasons to occur. And then finally, big game hunting. I think we, we saved the best for last. Um, this will include three proposals or three species we have proposals for, including some opportunity to increase bear um, training and hunting. And then, of course, deer and turkey, the new process that Mark talked about back in October and again in January. And the director talked about this adaptive harvest management. So, again, these, this is kind of the order we'll go through. I'll ask Wally, uh, Wally Aikens, our assistant chief over Habitat, to come. He'll start with the WMAs, and then Mark will take over uh, shortly after that. Oh, sorry. A couple more slides. We do welcome comments year-round. Um, we have an email account there. This year, the increase in comments that we received um, – was um, I think based on partly the change to our deer and turkey folks that already in engaged with us throughout the summer, change to our deer and turkey folks that already in engaged with us throughout the summer and fall. But we also create a new way for, uh, we think it's easier for folks to comment. We created a kind of a website where if you're interested in deer, you just go on the website, click on deer and then provide your comments. So it's an easy way for folks to uh, provide comments uh, sort of in those different compartments or species or seasons. It allowed us to take all those comments more quickly and compile them. Instead of an email that folks may have three or four different types of rec recommendations in there, we're able to get, get those parsed out. So thank you to those that use the tool. Um, again, we, we received the email input and all of that's together, as well as the commissioner input. So we, we looked at all that input together. And I just want to give you um, these kind of overall numbers for the input we received. So we had almost 6,000 individuals either in the online tool or send an email, and they provided eight, over 8,000 comments. So Again, this, I believe, is the record. I've been here 10 years now, and I think this is the most comments we've ever received. So thank you to those folks that provided that input. Uh, we summarized the comments with some software um, using artificial intelligence. I think we shared a little bit of that uh, in January. Mark Mark shared that. Uh, and again, this, this is just the generic season input. There's a whole number of additional folks that comment, commented in addition to this, specifically on the adaptive harvest management process uh, or the packages for deer and turkey. And again, Mark will show some of those numbers, I believe. So here are the numbers. I won't read through them. You know, almost 3,000 comments on deer season. So again, these are high, higher numbers than we've ever had. 1,300 small game, small game and fur bears and on and on. And you see there's a, another category at the end called other that are just miscellaneous comments. So again, almost 6,000 folks provided input on these as and uh, over 8,000 comments individually. So with that, if there's no questions, I'll turn it over to Wally. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, the way the way we're working the committee system this year, please, any of the commissioners, please direct your questions to the commissioner, the chair of the, whatever uh, committee we're on. So if you have a question, please direct your question to Chairman Wright, and he'll uh, recognize you at the appropriate time. And uh, be aware that only com committee members vote, and but all the commissioners can participate in the dialogue of the conversation. So. 
Commissioner Wright, I'll turn it back to you. Um, you go from there. Just quickly, Chief Benedict, I had one thing to bring up, but I don't know the appropriate time. It's probably pertains mostly to manners and means. Would you just prompt me when that right time to bring that to you? Or sure, we could, we could hear that now. We could okay. hear that now. Okay, just just one request that I had. If um, this is spur of the moment, but for tomorrow, if if the agency, if your team could put together uh, what it would look like for us to have a night predator season when those times would occur and considering safety and our, our constituents and our TWA partners, um, I'd really love to look at that and have the agency look at that and bring it back tomorrow for the full consideration, uh, full view of the uh, commission, not consideration because we won't be voting on anything tomorrow, but just for preview what that might look like. Um, I have my own ideas, but I'd love to hear what you all have and you could put together for us by tomorrow. Certainly, Mr. Chairman, we'd be glad to do that. We'll work with law enforcement and legal this afternoon or this evening and, and come up with that. I guess if I might take a few minutes, a couple of questions. Um, if it's a predator hunting at night, I believe is what you said. Um, what are the other considerations for weapons that you want us to consider? Any specifics on that? Any specifics on season dates and, and timing? Um, yep. Any anything specific that we could we could look at? Well, I can tell you what I have in mind, and y'all can put it together, and what we can merge those with your recommendations. But it seems to me like to merge safety with uh, provide a new opportunity um, for hunters. But um, it would be shotgun only. Maybe limit that to no single projectile, no double up buck. So it'd have to be smaller shot size and double up buck. Um, that'd be my view i think with tss today you know the lethality and the you know if we're trying to regulate distance it's hard to do that with shot size when you're talking about tss so those would be my thoughts would be private lands only um uh probably a, maybe put together some sort of safety video and you have to watch a safety video and take a small quiz um but i think we we rule out a lot of the safety issues by limiting a shotgun only that'd be my thoughts um private land only or permission um, it'd be interesting to see what other states are doing if we could pull that together. And not that we have to do what they do, we need to do the right thing, but it'd be interesting to see what our neighboring states do. Um, as far as season goes, I think that would really depend on what we do with deer season. If, if the deer season, if we follow the agency preview recommendation, then this could start January 15th. If we don't, then in certain areas of state, it would start later. Oh, well, yeah, in the southwest corner, it would start later. So, is that what you're asking for? Yes, sir. What is I'm hearing that? is outside of deer season. Is that is that what you the sort of the intent there? Uh, yeah, and I don't think we want to disturb deer season uh, or turkey season. You know, January fifteenth to March fifteenth, and maybe June first to August fifteenth, et cetera. Just I think we make and bobcat and coyote only, and let y'all research and see what you come back with. We they may not mesh very well with that. Okay. Right. Um, I guess maybe the last question that I have here kind of off the cuff would be, is there any consideration for a bag limit? Those are the season dates, length, weapons, and bag limit are kind of the, the package. I can hear a whisper that says no, but, uh, uh, well, really interested in what you, you guys think, you know, the coyotes an invasive species, if to be honest, I mean, really, they weren't here till the eighties. So, um, I, I think, I think that y'all are going to have a big input on that. If there's, a limit on coyote, maybe no, bobcat, maybe yes. Not sure. Okay. We'll get with law enforcement and uh, maybe have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grant staff present that tomorrow. We'll make a slide or two and uh, share some thoughts. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, commissioners, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm those that don't know me, Wally Akins, I'm Assistant Chief of the Habitat Section <clears throat> for the Wildlife Division. I start out going over a preview of our wildlife management area recommendations for the um, for this coming year and next two years. Uh, first, we want to recommend establishing two new uh, refuges, Catoosa Ridge and Holly Fork Creek, have some hunting opportunities there. We looked at our statewide WMA regulations with staff and we, want, we have one or two new and a, a couple amended <clears throat> statewide general regulations that will uh, cover all WMAs. And then lastly, get to the individual WMA recommendations. And as Joe mentioned, we want to 
you know, really trying to simplify, provide more opportunity and consistency for with a lot of our WMAs. <clears throat> In Region 1, we uh, established Holly Fort Creek Refuge. It's 125 acres in Henry County. I've had a lot of work in cooperation with National Wild Turkey Federation there. I want to recommend two hunts for youth um, uh, and a quota of two. <clears throat> the other refuge we have is in Region 3. It's Catoosa Ridge. It's 1,700 acres on the west side of Catoosa, WMA. Uh, we want to have some small game hunting opportunities there, but not start those till the first Saturday in December. Um, however, Rabbit and Woodcock would only be three days a week there, Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. We won't have quail hunting opportunities there yet. We hope to in the future, and trapping uh, uh, will also start later in the year. Looking at statewide WMA regs, the um, one amendment we have, and this is to to mirror what the language in the rule or be consistent with the language that is in the rule now. And, and just, we already had a um, uh, prohibit, prohibiting placement of feed and grain on our WMAs, but we want to add salt products and minerals to that, uh, to that regulation. <clears throat> Every two years we go over our duck blinds, number of tiers and quota hunt sites. We have no, recommendation changes there, still have those in place. And then our new w WMA regulations that we looked at, and again, our staff got together, all these recommendations, it was in some shape or fashion on several different WMAs across the state. So how can we make these more consistent and simple for our users? So all do dogs not actively engaged in hunting need to be restrained or on a leash, some sort. And then, unless otherwise stated, allow the take of fur bears during any big game or small game hunt with the legal weapon and by a legal hunter, um, with the exception of, of not being able to use dogs. Moving on to Region 1, um, <clears throat> you can see the list of WMAs that we're going to have recommendations for. The first recommendation covers several WMAs, and I'll list those on the next slide. Um, but is to have an opening day of the spring turkey season, the fourth Sunday of, of the season, or I'm sorry, the beginning of the season until the fourth Sunday, one turkey and no, uh, no fall hunting season for turkeys. Now, the ones that this does affect, the change will be, you have them listed there. Uh, and then on the bottom, you have another list of WMAs that already has this regulation in place, but these WMAs have an open fall season. So to go along with that recommendation, we do recommend uh, closing fall season on those WMAs listed at the bottom, Ernest Rice, Horns Bluff, Tully, et cetera. And again, those already have um, the four week turkey season, only one, one bird bag limit in place. The other WMA uh, in region one, no myelin, um, turkey or deer hunts this year is a, a recommendation by the, the Army National Guard due to some lo logistical issues. Um, and also um, move White Oak WMA open as statewide deer regulations with for gun, archery, and muzzleloader. President's Island, we want to increase the quota from 30 to 50. It was reduced to 30 back four or five years ago. We want to move that back to 50 hunters. Um, and you know, try to increase the opportunity there. Uh, we also have a request from the Port Authority to restrict access to President's Island other than quota permit holders. So other than deer hunters, um, no one would be allowed to access that area. For tumbleweed, we recommend a uh, turkey season similar or well, just like uh, Chickasaw or I'm sorry, Natchez Trace and Wolf River. It's a two hunts per week after the season begins for a total of 12 hunts for a quota of 12 hunters and a one bird bag limit. All right, moving on to region two. Um, got several recommendations for region two. They're 
very simple and again to improve uh, consistency and simplicity. Uh, Bear Hollow, we want to increase the bag limit to uh, coincide with the statewide limit. It's currently restricted to one deer per day. Uh, remove the fall turkey quota of 50 on Cheatham Lake and move to a statewide season. We want to clarify some language at Haynes Bottom uh, around the waterfowl blind areas to make that more consistent with other WMAs. It will prohibit some activities uh, other than waterfowl hunting uh, around those areas there. And also at Haynes Bottom and Shelton's Ferry, uh, allows young sportsmen to use shotgun and muzzleloader during the sportsman young sportsman's hunt. Uh, currently, it is archery only. At Headwaters, have some dog hunting at night, uh, dog training and, and raccoon and possum hunting, which is a current restriction. And at Old Hickory, Unit 2, prohibit the use of centerfire rifles due to some safety concerns we have there. Uh, that also will be similar to uh, Percy Priest, WMA, Old Hickory. Um, Lower Hill, we've got several recommendations here. Again, to simplify these regulations, move to a statewide trapping season and also to allow dog training at night. Um, oh, and also open waterfowl the same as statewide with the exception of Laurel Hill Lake, which will only be open the last two weeks of the waterfowl season. We also want to increase the deer archery season from two to eight weeks. We recognize a very um, high interest, large interest in horseback riding, um, but still have give them some opportunity to ride during the fall. Um, and then also for the young sportsman's hunt and the one non-quota gun hunt they have to increase that bag limit to two deer, either six. Um, currently it is only one deer either sex, and also to allow small, allow small game hunting during the archery season. <laughs> Percy Priest is a field trial area, largely, and um, a lot of use for the local community out there. Currently, when they have an organized field trial, any uh, participant of that trial can come 72 hours before or after those trials and, and use the grounds and uh, not have to uh, have a license. We propose to uh, allow that period of time, uh, reduce it down to only one day or 24 hours before and after the field trial. And the Field Trial Association, staff of Region 2 has worked a lot with them. They are support of this recommendation. <clears throat> also, we've um, worked with them to only allow ATVs on certain areas of that WMA. Um, Previously, they could ride just about uh, all over the WMA, or they could. Now they have two larger areas, one around the ponds and then a smaller field down next to the lake that they can use ATVs to uh, train their uh, dogs. <clears throat> um, again, for simplicity, remove the uh, move to crow season statewide, same as statewide. We have a stake position requirement on dove fields, remove that, and also move archery season to be uh, same as statewide, except closed during the young sportsman's hunt the end of October. Also due to increased price in our lease agreement we have with a timber company in region two, um, we're not able to renew the lease for Arnold Hollow. WMA, it is a loss of about 6,600 acres in Wayne County that will be effective this July. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> moving to region three, we've got um, a few other re recommendations here. Try to align the muzzleloader season with the statewide season, which would add a week for that area. And also we wanna propose the establishment of uh, four one-day quail quota hunts. We've never done this in the state. Uh, it would be a quota of one per person, but they could bring two additional hunters to accompany them, bag limit of three per person, and we'll have the dates there for the hunts. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you are non-hunting participant, you're not allowed on those areas. For Catoosa, we have a regulation or uh, language that's been in a hunting guide for years. It's really not a regulation, but to permit off 
highway vehicles from fourth Saturday of August until the second Sunday of June. The youth turkey hunt would be the Saturday and Sunday of the statewide turkey season. And then the uh, normal, they would have a turkey season that opens the Saturday after that for four consecutive weeks and weeks. And this is very similar to the current regulations is when the youth starts and then they have a number of one and two and three day hunts there on Contisa. Also to change the second muzzleloader quota gun hunt, I'm, I'm sorry, second muzzleloader gun hunt to a gun hunt uh, with no changes in dates or bag limits. On Louver Mountain, we do not have any regulations for OHV, but want to make a recommendation similar to Catoosa for OHVs permitted for Saturday in August through the second Sunday of June. <clears throat> Oak Ridge, we've had a typically an, uh, a lot of a number of leftover permits each year for those hunts. We've also lost some area to hunting due to uh, land use transfers and land use changes. So we want to reduce those permits by 250 per hunt. Uh, we issue over 3,100 permits. So um, we're re reducing the total number by 750 for the year. Moving on to region four, lastly, um, Buffalo Springs, archer equipment only during the deer season for safety reasons. Going along with that, shotgun only during the small game and turkey season. It's currently open, same as statewide, with any weapon of choice. Forks of the River, we're aligning the youth adult dove field with the adult field. Um, have the opening, opening day, the Saturday, and then Labor Day, and then the rest of the year. For North Cumberland and Cove Creek WMA, they, those two WMAs have very similar regulations um, currently. So for both of those, we um, have a turkey season, same as statewide, except only one bearded turkey during the first two weeks or 14 days, uh, not to exceed two bearded turkeys for, for the year. Also at North Cumberland, this is just a cleanup of a current regulation. Uh, there is a blaze orange requirement for users uh, outside of a vehicle or outside of camp, but we missed um, not including waterfowl hunters um, or if you're in a designated safety zone, as well as elk hunters, um, that uh, you would have this blaze orange requirement, visible front and back, 500 square inches. We're adding four days of archery at North Cherokee during the archery bear season, that is. Currently, there's a split season. If we move it to statewide, it would add four days. And at Rankin WMA, allow wild, wild hogs to be taken during the deer and turkey seasons. <clears throat> I think this is last. Uh, Odie Mills Refuge, we have uh, the scout days are currently the Mondays prior to a scheduled deer hunt. So we want to move those to the Saturday prior and also uh, move the young sportsman's archery hunt to the second Saturday and Sunday of November. It's currently the first week of November. And that's it for wildlife management areas. Thank you, um, Wiley, for all, all that uh, great report. A at this time, we we're going to throw a lot at the uh, general public today and our commissioners. So if there's any uh, questions or comments from the general public, we'd like to entertain those at this time only on the subject matter that was just presented. And uh, so at this time, anybody would like to be recognized, uh, please come forward and tell your name. Okay, seeing none, I'll now uh, ask any of the commissioners if you have something to say, please uh, text Commissioner Wright and he'll recognize you for uh, questions. And this is, Questions only, no uh, deliberation or voting. Thank you. Rather than text anyone on wildlife committee, have a question. I can't see Commissioner, Commissioner Butt. I have a question about uh, two or three different things. Okay. One is that. Uh, 
my understanding is we're expanding uh, archery season uh, on Laurel Hill. Does that include Laurel Hill only? Yes, sir, about six weeks. And since uh, state law says uh, there's to be no uh, ATVs, horseback riding, trail uh, hikers uh, during hunting season, then that would prohibit uh, uh, almost 20 year tradition of, of horseback riding on Laurel Hill. Uh, I would uh, ask that uh, staff reconsider that maybe in, at least having a break of one, possibly uh, from a PR standpoint of trying to do something that we allow horseback riders that pay a fee. Uh, right. And we've allowed that. So uh, uh, at least maybe a, a, a split between uh, the September last two weeks and October or, or other consideration, maybe one, maybe two if or one, uh, if, if that would be possible. Yes, sir. I think that'd be certainly possible. We'll get with our staff. And, and uh, the second question I had <laughs> is uh, with that law in effect, is there an exception for North Cumberland uh, for OHV riders during hunting season? Uh, that they can continue to ride uh, while we have elk hunting going on? Uh, I think OHV riding, the prohibition is not applicable to North Cumberland, but I would have to check that rule myself. Um, I think they can ride as long as they have the blaze orange on and outside of that campground. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and I realize that, that we are addressing and trying to simplify lots of areas, but they are wildlife management areas, and and I understand that's our main priority. But at the same time, we've allowed certain activities to go on for a number of years. And so how do we uh, balance what we've allowed the public to do and, and not get into a, a public relations issue with, with the public and try to at least address their concerns? Uh, and then my last question is that during all of uh, those few uh, changes that you mentioned being numerous, uh, I didn't hear Bobcats mentioned that uh, would be permissible to take during archery season. Had we discussed that before and, and allowed that? Uh, so that, that was in one of the new general regulations I had for WMAs to include all fur bears. Okay. Uh, during a, a legal hunt by a legal, uh, legal hunter okay. with a weapon type. So that okay. would include archery. So that yes, takes sir. care of that. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Commissioner Blue. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, one of your very first slides talked about the Holly Fork Refuge. And mm -hmm. I know Manager Wheat, uh, Mr. Brad Wheat is here as well. What what hunts do we have scheduled for Holly Fork? So that's and, and if they're not scheduled in there, we can't. Um, that's well, only hunts that are allowed, right? That's correct. It would be two. Wouldn't be. They would be held, hunts, special hunts held in event manager, but the National Wild Turkey Federation would pick what youth they would take. The dates are in October, and it would be two youth per hunt. Okay, and they're deer hunts. Yes, sir. For an October, they are deer hunts. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, last question I had. Well, what about? Let me ask this. What about turkey hunts? Are we going to do any turkey hunts on there? We don't have any scheduled at this time, but I think we could look at that possibly. Yeah. Um, okay. We couldn't get them scheduled between now and next turkey season, though, could we? I mean, we wouldn't vote on it, or would we? I guess we would vote on it prior to that, but we wouldn't be able to vote on it in time to have them scheduled hunts on Holly Fork. But well, then, would we? we could. We'd need to talk with NWTF to see if they're willing, and then there may be some safety concerns there as well. Okay. For, for turkey hunts, but do you have some more information on that? Okay. Yes, sir, if, if I might. Wow. Um, my understanding is, I had the same question to my staff, my understanding is that uh, the habitat isn't very conducive for turkeys at this point. So I think there's some management there we're thinking about doing there, but there's there's no turkeys there to have a, a hunt as, as far as my understanding on that. That's why there's no recommendation for those hunts. Okay. Gotcha. 
Um, hey, and last thing, just kind of food for thought. I don't know if we've ever thought about this, but this has been brought up to me on some of our WMA properties. Some of our WMA properties that are quite large, uh, but we have the rules that you have you can't have a side by side on them or no off road motor vehicles um, are allowed on there. It's foot traffic only or foot hunting only most of the time. I've had the question brought to me um, on some of our WMAs if we'd ever thought about. I know they're becoming more and more popular about the motorized bicycles, the mm -hmm. motorized bikes to access, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres uh, that obviously they're not um, destructive to the land for the most part. They're not like a, you know, side by side or four wheeler, but the, the, the bikes, motorized bikes that are people utilizing now to access deeper parts of acreage. If we ever thought about that, could act, so, that. so my understanding is even though they're a motorized bike, they're considered a bicycle. So by our rule and regs, they're not, um, it, it's still considered a bicycle and a non-motorized piece of equipment. Am I correct or not? <laughs> so, uh, Commissioner Ballou, the, uh, the General Assembly passed legislation a few years ago <clears throat> that um, separated those battery powered bicycles into three classes and it would depend on the class at issue to determine whether it could be considered like a, a motorbike. And it's it's related to the power generated and the miles per hour. So for um, it, it would depend, the bike has to be labeled because that's an industry requirement now. But if it falls under the, I think a class one and two, don't quote me on that, but I can get you that answer. It is still considered a bicycle for all intents and purposes. Yes. Well, Again, to simplify it to some folks, you know, I, I think it would be cool if we could maybe, I don't know, just let them know that a motorized battery powered bike is allowed and not, mm -hmm. you know, prohibited on some WMA properties. Somehow or another, if we could make that more transparent, you know, you know what I mean, to, to the general public where they think that that's not a motorized vehicle and maybe expound on this General Assembly ruling and let them, let them, uh, right. Certainly are becoming more popular. They are, yeah. And it saves, saves you a little foot time for sure. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission at large? Commissioner Cox? Well, where did you, who, and I may have talked about this before, Preston's out. Did the Port Authority call us or was it, did we go to them for a discussion about not allowing people on there. Uh, is the, they got a they got a trespassing problem. They do have an issue with people accessing that area, and they didn't want as many people doing that. And outside of hunting season, especially during the summer, there were some people on that that property. Well, when we got this hunt uh, and, and subsequent meetings I've had with them, one of the biggest reasons. In fact, the only reason they let us use it is so we will help keep people off of it. So that is critical to us keeping presence out. I, I just make that point that we, whatever we do, we need to we need to make sure that that we're we're keeping people off that as best that the local guys can do. Yes, sir. Um, my second question is: there are no non-hunting people allowed on the quail hunt. Does, does that mean that that if I want to go hunt that I cannot take my grandchild and teach him how to quail hunt? Sir, you know, that probably would prevent me from doing that. It would be no one that's not drawn for that hunt or that is accompanying the hunter on that area. It will be a specific area that the hunt will be on. So if you're not drawn or... Uh, like I said, a company. So you, if you did have your grandchild with you, certainly if you were using that area only. But okay, so so clarify yeah. that out. What what do you? So mean? yeah, outside of that area, anybody could go on the WMA, just not in that hunt area. Okay, so wherever your hunt area is, you could have two non-hunting people with you if they're accompanying the person the that's hunter. drawn. Yes, okay, sir. Right. yes, sir. Uh, and Looper. OHV, is there OHV riding on it now? Very much. Okay. All right. Thanks. Anyone else? 
Okay. Turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Wally. All right. Thank um, you, Wally. I, I do have the fur bear. Would, it's only one slide if we wanted to continue Go ahead. that. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. All right. For the fur bear proclamation, the only recommendation we have is to um, to mirror the, the rule and regulation that has been proposed to remove long-tailed weasel and spotted skunk from take. Um, due to their elevated status on the state list. And that's it. For that, for that one. Thank you, Wally. Sir. All right. At this time, we'll call Assistant Chief Mark McBride to come forward to talk about raptors and migratory game birds. Take right at this issue. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with uh, a, a kind of a proclamation that we don't cover very often, but this was a request that came from some falconers, and it pertains to the take of raptors. They take wild raptors, train them, and then hunt with them. Um, so really what they were looking for was just to adjust the timing uh, of when they, they could go and take these raptors from the wild. Um, so the first change would be to expand the period when they could take young raptors from the nest. Um, currently, they can take them May 1st through June 30th. This would just expand that another month because a lot of those nestling birds are a little too young with that current end date. Um, so we worked with them. We're fine with this. Um, however, we did offer um, to take American kestrels out as allowable because their population has has really drastically de declined ac across the southeast. Um, so we just want to protect those birds in the nest because there's kind of a lot of, you know, evidence out there that that going to the nest could lead predator lead predators to those nests. Um, so we'll just pull kestrels out of of that specific portion of the the regulations. Um, and then the second adjustment would be to expand the period when falconers could take passage birds, and these are just migra migratory birds in the wild. Um, they could take those year round. This aligns with U.S. Fish and Wildlife regulations. Um, and then within that, there'd be still a few restrictions on a couple of species to protect them during important parts of their life cycle. Um, and that is American kestrels can only be taken August 15th through January 14th. And great horned owls can only be taken August 15th through October 31st. Any questions on that? This time we'll invite anybody from the public that would like to ask a question pertaining to what uh, Mark just covered. Seeing none, anybody from the uh, Wildlife Committee have any questions for Mark? Commissioner Butt? If we're trying to protect American kestrels, why would we allow them to be taken as adults? Uh, so all of the, the work that's been done, the, the falconry take is very, very small. Um, so we're only talking a couple birds. It's it's negligible to the overall population. Um, but American kestrels are one of the few species that apprentice falconers can take because they're easier to train and easier to maintain. So it's still important for those those falconers early in their career to be able to have those birds. So from from our side, there's there's no resource concern with with the few birds that would get the few passage birds that would get taken out. So if every state around and, and everybody allowed all of that, then that seems like if they're th endangered species or threatened species, then it would just make common sense to take them off the list completely. I don't believe they're at the point that they're protected in any sort. There's just some concerns because they're declining. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you, so March uh, next part is a long part, so I think at this point we'll take a break. Everybody's had lunch, and so we'll come back at uh, 10 minutes after 2 and start on our uh, presentation. Just let me get the easy one out of the way.
Try to get it. I'd like to call on Chairman uh, Hank Wright to uh, continue the meeting. All right, we'll give the floor to Mark McBride. Before we do, I just had one thing to add for Chief Benedict and his department, and that's regarding the nighttime predator consideration. Just adding a little more language and clarity about lighting, if we can. I know some people are, including myself, are a little bit color challenged, and so with those lenses, we have a hard time seeing. But I think I think lighting makes sense. Spotlighting, thermal, night vision should all be okay. But no loud, no lighting that's mounted on vehicles. It should all be handheld. But that's the only thing I wanted to add is just if they would consider that and bring that to us tomorrow to look at. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, we'll uh, we'll jump. Yeah. I'm sorry. And electronic calls, obviously. So electronic calls to be included. Yes, sir. Sorry. Thank you, Mark. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> we'll jump right back into the uh, recommendations here. And um, next up, we've got migratory game birds and waterfowl. Um, so for most of the migratory game birds, almost all of them, there's no changes. You know, there's simple calendar changes, but season lengths and bag limits are staying the same. Um, they all fall within the federal frameworks. Um, but we did want to present a couple different options related to the waterfowl seasons because the calendar gets a little wonky with the really late Thanksgiving that we have this year. Um, so option one, this is what our current format is where we, we open the first phase, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we hunt two days and then we break and go 58 days back from January 31st and just go late and straight. Um, and you can see with this late Thanksgiving, that only gives us a three day break between the first phase and the second phase. And the second phase would start on a Thursday and then it runs all the way through the end of January, which is a Friday this year. So the youth hunt would be the following day. Um, option two would be a slight adjustment to that where we would actually move the Thursday and Friday that would start the second phase. We would move those to the beginning of the first phase so that we had two Saturday openers. Um, so we would start as we traditionally do the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we would just run for four days, then break for a couple, start again, Saturday the seventh. This still runs us all the way to the end of January with no break between the final day of the regular season and the youth hunt. Um, and then lastly, it, it, between the end of the duck season and the youth hunt would just be to go no split at all. We would start when we traditionally do the Saturday after Thanksgiving and just run 60 days straight. Um, so that would that would have the season ending on January 28th and give a little break there before the youth hunt. Um, and so we did want to also add this slide that shows when those these youth and veteran hunts are placed after the season. Um, and I believe this work came when we got the veteran appreciation hunt. Um, there was a, there were some polls that were done to ask hunters, when do you want the youth and veteran hunts to occur? And they didn't want, they wanted to, them to occur separately. They didn't want kids and veterans out there at the same time. They wanted to separate those, um, and then also split them across two different weekends so that they could maximize the chance that, that either one of those hunts for veterans or, or for the youth just coincided with a good front front when the duck hunting was good. Um, so I'm going to go on to cranes real quick, and then we'll just, we'll be able to discuss some of this waterfowl stuff. Um, so just a quick recap of the crane season this past year. We had a total of, of 3,891 applicants for, for the 2,500 tags. Um, there was 2,600 or so single applicants and then 403 parties, um, and the party sizes ranged from two to six. This was the first year that, that parties could apply. Um, and I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but of the permits that were awarded, it was distributed pretty evenly among single applicants in the parties. Um, so everyone seems happy. The party people got permits. So did the single applicants. Um, and so these are preliminary numbers, but there's 554 cranes harvested this year, which is a little lower than usual, I believe, um, but still a good number. So <clears throat> the crane season for this upcoming year, same dates and structures. You can see the dates there. Um, and there is that break in the southeast crane zone. Um, for the crane festival. So uh, I'll open it to any discussion now about waterfowl or, or cranes. Okay, th thank you, Mark. Uh, just a uh, housekeeping matter. Uh, commissioners, please turn your microphone on when you talk and get as close to the mic as possible. So uh, our guys on the right can uh, hear you clearly. So at this time, anybody from the public uh, have any questions or comments? 
Seeing none, I'll turn it back to Chairman Wright to uh, solicit questions from the commission. Okay, anyone on the commission with questions? Can't see who it is. Go ahead, Mr. Salzman. Uh, did y'all have discussion on the, the different dates within the committee and can, can give a little synopsis on the thought process on each one? Or is that for our discussion this afternoon? I'm sorry. Is that a question for me? It is. Yeah. So I was just asking, did y'all have this discussion already within the committee? Uh, about the different date selections for the waterfowl hunt and the different breaks? And if so, what's the synopsis of it? Or is it for the discussion this afternoon? I think it's for discussion today, depending on the chairman, if that's okay. We've had no discussions prior. We've seen this on a preview call. I'll ask uh, General Counsel uh, Tory Grimes. I think today we just are presented and then the discussion will be next week, if I'm correct. So this is only a presentation today and all discussion uh, based on questions asked would be uh, done next month when we actually vote. So I would guess, um, Commissioner Saltzman, if you had a specific question, you can ask the question and then we'll take it under consideration for next month. No, I, I will uh, save my discussion for the appropriate time. I just, as I know it would shock the commission as a waterfowler, I might have some thoughts on that. Oh, so. You, you can go ahead and give your thoughts today, but I'm yeah. just not, we're not voting today. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Butt? I do. What? So it's, it, can we go back to the dates? <laughs> So I would be interested in what are the goals of the youth hunt? I, I just provide an exclusive opportunity for kids to get out there and hunt. And uh, I might ask Commissioner Childress to get his thoughts on this since he's been so involved in it. Would it would be the thought process to let them shoot ducks? Yes, sir. And have a lot of ducks to shoot at. Yes, sir. Okay, so that might give a little bit of reason to have a couple of days rest before we have the youth hunt. So yes. that's that's the conversation. I, Wally, you've done this more than anybody else taking the kids out there. I'm just going to take a, a tough question for you. Do the kids get excited to sit in the blind uh, and not shoot, or do they like to shoot and kill ducks? They get excited, but they lose interest if you're not killing ducks. Okay. And so as we kind of go through this process, I think it's important as we look at this for the dates and we obviously trying to take care of a lot of people is I would be more, I would lean towards more to having a couple of days rest before we do the youth hunt and obviously keep it on a Saturday and Sunday is important to that. You want my comments now on that? A couple of days is not enough. So what's your thought on if the goal for the youth hunt is to have them, they've got that, they've got the first, February 1st, and then again, one of the maps has it on the following week on the 8th. What would be your thoughts on that, Wally? What we seen just last year, even as bad as it was, the first youth hunt was a lot better than the second one after the week rest because of weather. You were getting later in the year. And my other thought is when you end it three or four days, a lot of the people take their decoys and leave, and it cuts down on the opportunity. I think if it's closer, they'll hunt through that day, just like they were in the standard season and more kids will get a chance to hunt. So what's your thoughts on the, which, which date selection would you like? Oh, I think the best one's the same way we've had where it won't be confusing two days and then the full season until the seasons get shorter from 60 days. Got it. Thank you. Any other commissioners, commissioner, Buck? Uh, has the public seen this, or is this the first time that it's been put out in the public comment? Do we? This will be the first time it's put out in the public comment. Okay. So um, then between now and, and our April meeting, then there'll be plenty, 30 days at least. Yes, sir. It, comment. Yes, sir. And we're, we're actually going to use a similar tool that we did during the open comment period. So we're going to put this out, point people to our proposals, and encourage them to give specific feedback on the proposals to really – narrow down what people think about what we're proposing. Well, knowing what's happened in the past, I'm sure several, if not all of us, will get all kinds of questions and comments about it, even going to the website. Yes, sir. Commissioner Blue. Yeah, hey, just curious, what, what does the federal framework say on 
the juvenile hunt and the youth hunt? I know it's got to be February, but what's the deadline? So it can be 14 days before or 14 days, up to 14 days after the season ends. So there's wiggle room there. So you could do it up front, one up front, one at the end, but it has to fall within 14 days of either when you start or finish the season. And it has to occur either on a weekend or a period when kids aren't in school. So, so it's going to be day or 14 something. days within January 31st. Yes. Okay. Or November 30th, if that's where we start. Right, right. Yeah. And then also one and then two. Not, I know this does not affect this year whatsoever, but moving forward into next year's season, not this coming season, but the following season, that's when we will out. Of, we will be – out of our contract with the federal framework, the North American Flyway, and we can have more than one split. So we won't be we won't be out of our contract with the federal framework. We will have the opportunity to propose different zones and splits. Okay, I just so want to we'll, clarify. But yes, right. yes, that will be the 26, 27 season. Right, right. Yes, sir. Then we could have more than one split. Yes. Yep. We if we were to go to one zone. Right. Amen. Uh, Commissioner Cox. I ask this every time we talk about Sand Hills. Is there going to be a time or do we need to request that Sand Hills don't have a quota? That My understanding was we had four years of this quota or five years of this quota, and then we would have open season like ducks. And that has been seven or eight years. So I'm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am not positive. I'm going to have someone come up and answer that because I'm not sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so Sandhill Crane, the eastern population of Sandhill Cranes, which is what we harvest here in Tennessee, are regulated by the EP Crane um, Harvest Strategy. Um, that is set to allow certain a percentage of the population to be harvested within the flyway. So Kentucky, Alabama, Tennessee have seasons. Um, those permits are allocated um, in that plan. And so um, the plan's up, to, up for renewal, but the feds give us uh, – the agreement with the feds and the flyway is to have a certain number of cranes be taken from that population so that we don't over harvest those, those birds. So my understanding is we'll continue the next update of the plan might change the numbers, but there, there still will be a total allowable harvest of cranes from the EP population in the Mississippi flyway. So the numbers might change for Tennessee or for other States, but there will be a requirement that we only limit harvest to that number of birds, which is why we have to issue a certain number of tags. We can't over issue, um, based on the agreement we have with the service. So all the other states are on quotas also? Th those that harvest the EP cranes. Some of the cranes, like if you go to Texas and Kansas, there's a different yeah, population. Yeah, I'm talking about ours, yeah. Yes, sir. About ours. Yes, sir. All right, so what, are the, what, are the, what is the maximum versus what we're killing? What the three states are, I mean, where, are we killing all that we can? I believe, Jamie Federson is here, our migratory bird coordinator. I believe we have the highest quota of any state. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jamie Federson, Migratory Game Bird Program Coordinator. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cox, yeah, we we are currently at our maximum issued uh, quota for sandhill crane tags. We are not harvesting them all, uh, but that's just based on our hunters. Some can't harvest birds and some don't even go hunting. So, um, yeah, so the overall number of tags that are issued throughout the flyway uh, we are all at our maximum quota for the number of birds we can we can harvest, but the hunters just aren't harvesting those those numbers. Yeah, I, and I understand that, but the compare the number of hunters, I mean the number of birds we're harvesting versus the maximum they allow. What's the difference? Is it if they allow two thousand and we're killing one thousand, or what's the number? Yeah, I, so the number is probably about we're probably at about oh not quite. 50% of what we're allowed to take. Yeah. So why can't we increase the quota? 
And more people participate. Yeah, that's going to take, a, as, as Chief Benedict said, that's going to take a change in the harvest strategy within the management plan that all of the states in the Mississippi and Atlantic Flyway and the Fish and Wildlife Services are, have, have agreed upon. So we're in the process of revising that harvest strategy, and those discussions will happen. We're, we're Now that we've got several years of, you know, we've got 13 years of Kentucky hunting birds, hunting those cranes. We've got like 11 years for Tennessee. We've got a lot of data now that we can probably work on um, trying to get to what you're, what, what, what you're talking about is, uh, you know, maximizing the harvest that we are allowed. And so we're, we're going to work on strategies to, to, to figure that out and try to make that happen. You think we'll have a request that we just do away with quotas and, and open the season? Oh, I'd say during the revision, everything's going to be on the table. Um, but we're just going to do what uh, we're going to follow the science and do what's responsible um, for that population. Any other commissioners have questions about the waterfowl or any other items that Mark's been talking about? It seems like the youth will have more opportunity if we have it lined up right at the end of the season because everybody still has their equipment out, but it seems like they're going to need at least a week to rest or more to have better quality hunting, and it's really weather dependent. So unless we have a crystal ball, we got to do the best we can. All right, uh, so I'm going to move on to the big game proc now. Uh, we'll go ahead and just provide a quick highlight of the, the elk opportunities and the uh, harvest update from this previous year. Um, and then I'll move into bears, provide a quick harvest update, and we'll talk about the recommendations. And then we'll move into deer and turkeys. I'll give just a, a refresher, a high-level background of all this adaptive harvest, harvest management stuff we've been doing, and then go specifically into deer and turkeys. So the elk season, successful as usual. Um, you can see the numbers there. All but two of the archery hunters were successful. All but one of the gun hunters was successful. Um, and the youth hunter was successful on their hunt as well. And so if you look at the pictures here, these are all very high quality bulls. Um, and and the, smile on, the smiles on all of those faces really says it all. This is a, a really cool program and opportunity for people to be able to harvest a, an elk in Tennessee. Um, so we did want to remind you guys of some changes that you approved during season setting last year. They will be effective for this fall season. Um, so two elk hunt zones were added, um, which added an additional four permits, two archery and two gun to the total. So there's now 19 total permits available. Um, and then we switched the, the gun season timing and the youth hunt timing so that that youth hunt would align with most counties in Tennessee with their fall break so that young hunters would have more opportunity to hunt that full week if they were drawn for a permit. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm, we'll move into bears real quick. And I just want to provide a little harvest summary. Um, so there are 629 bears reported harvest last year. Um, you can see that's right at about the five year average of 622. Um, and then we're also, you know, one of the important things we monitor here is, is the percent of the, the harvest that's female. Um, you want to make sure that's not creeping too high and you're not hitting the reproductive side of your population too hard. So at 40, we're watching it, but we're not concerned. Once you get about above 50 is where you start to, to maybe want to slow down a little bit. Um, but all signs do indicate our bear populations are staying steady, most of them slowly growing, um, which gets to some of these recommendations. We're going to be able to provide some more opportunity for folks. Um, so the first, and this was a request from the Tennessee Bear Hunters Association, um, and this we would add a 14-day spring training season in bear hunt zone one, two, and three. This would begin the Saturday after Memorial Day and run 14 days thereafter, so early June time frame. Um, this would occur on private lands only. A lot of the public land in these areas are the big national park and national forests, and this is an extremely busy time of year for them. Kids are getting out of school. Everyone's on vacation. Um which is kind of the reason for that private lands only designation during this time period. Those public lands do have training opportunities in the fall before the, the bear seasons. Um, <clears throat> bear hunt zone four. This is bear hunt zone four is, is on the Cumberland plateau and there's currently a four week archery hunt in those areas. The population estimate just came back this year. There's a thousand bears. We've been hearing from bear hunters up there. There's a lot more bears. We want more opportunity to hunt them with guns. Um, so, we, our bear coordinator looked at private in holdings up there, how many 
parcels were a thousand acres or greater and found there's quite a few. So um, we're proposing to add a two day gun hunt to bear hunt zone four. It would occur the second weekend in December. It'd be on private land only, but dogs would be allowed. Um, so that's bear hunt zone four. And then bear hunt zone five is we're proposing creating a new bear hunt zone. Um, so Hawkins and Hancock County are currently in a transitional zone where there's a four week archery season. Those two counties uh, account for 80% of the total harvest in the transitional zone. So we want to pull those two counties out because we know the bear population is a lot larger in those areas and add an opportunity to gun hunt. Um, so this would be a, a two day gun hunt that would occur the second weekend in December. It would occur on private land only. Um, but one of the differences here is there's very few parcels that are private parcels that are larger. Um, so there's much higher potential for conflict. So dogs would not be allowed in these bear hunt zone five hunts. Um, so this is just a map of, of what the bear hunt zones would look like. If, if these recommendations are approved, um, we would just add a fifth bear hunt zone there in Hawkins, Hawkins and Hancock County. Um, so quick recap at a 14 day spring training season, bear hunt zone four at a two day gun hunt dogs allowed, and then establish bear hunt zone five, which would be Hawkins and Hancock County and have a two day gun hunt. Um, but without dogs and be private lands only. So I think I'm, I'm going to pause here. If you guys want to cover any of that before I get into the deer and turkey stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And, um, I, I just really have to commend staff after being on this commission for five years, we talk about opportunity and everything you talked about in this recent presentation was more elk opportunity, more bear opportunity. So I, I'm just, uh, I think I speak for the whole commission that we commend you and your team for coming up with these wonderful opportunities for our sportsmen, which will hopefully drive license sales, uh, which we all know is very important to our, our future. Uh, do I have any comments from the public? Seeing none, uh, Commissioner Wright, I'll turn it over to you for commission comments. Any Commissioner Salzman? I, I just got to say one comment about the elk season. I was actually there in 95 when we released, I think, 19 elk with Governor Sunquist. And this was a dream that Governor Sunquist had, who we obviously – he passed away this year, and I know he would be very proud of everything that the commission's done, and the elk population is healthy. And I know Martha, uh, who's still who's still with us, would be very happy to hear this. So, I'd let, I might like to get some of those pictures and, and send to the former first lady if you can send it to me. Yes, sir. Good. Thank you, Commissioner Davenport. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Can you explain to me? I'm not a bear hunter. How, say, on a thousand acre track, two thousand acre track. When a dog strikes a bear, how far does he run? And then how do you prevent the dogs from crossing the property line? I'm going to ask our bear coordinator to come up because he's, he will be much more eloquent in answering that question. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dan Gibbs, bear program leader. So I was just speaking with commissioner little about that at the break. And, you know, you can't guarantee they won't run off property. I mean, if they, turn loose around the edge obviously that can happen you're hoping they're going to get in the middle and turn loose but a thousand acres is pretty good track of land and these bears have not been hunted with hounds so we anticipate that these will be pretty quick hunts if they won't run very far and then uh, you know we always traditionally start this kind of hunting later in the year uh, reduced uh, number of deer hunters on the, the landscape hope that helps the conflicts uh, short seasons, two days, uh, all of these things would help us go in and kind of evaluate how this hunt goes. Uh, we're not even sure how many tracks probably the hunters will be able to get permission to hunt on at this point. And then, so once we get a couple of years under a belt with this, then we'll evaluate how things are going. But to answer your question, you can't keep it from happening, but by going to those large blocks, uh, the probability is a lot less because your hunters do not want to spend time putting their guns away and knocking on doors and getting permission to go retrieve their dogs. They want to hunt. So they're going to look for areas where they don't believe that's going to likely happen. So does that help? Okay. Mr. Buck. Uh, those new areas that we are opening, uh, are OHVs allowed to use on those areas? Well, so all these hunts would be private land only. 
So that's that's up to the landowner. Oh, okay. Yeah. So no public lands, it's all private. No, as Dan said, the idea now is to really gauge interest and in how effective it is and what how many bears are taken, and then look at our WMAs and expanding. So eight and there. nine, which was the northern most, and those are private land sectors or zones where it's open. Are you talking about the elk hunts? The elk hunt. I'm oh. sorry, I didn't mean bears. Yeah. I meant elk. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, yes, there there are OHVs in a lot of those elk areas. So we're not able to curtail those in those areas at this time. Not at this time. And we looked into it last year, I believe, and, and there was there was there wasn't a lot of conflicts with the elk hunters. You know, they were seeing and hearing machines, but all the elk hunters still had opportunities to take elk and, and as you can see, good elk. Um <clears throat> so it I think the conversation last year was essentially it's it's part of this larger OHV issue we're looking at. Mr. Granberry. Hey, Mark, um, what, what is the range on these dog collars? I, I'm hearing up to a mile. So that would, once they know the boundaries of where they're hunting, wouldn't that keep them contained? I believe there, the range is on some of them might even be further than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. And as Dan said, hunters are, you know, they, they, they know they need to stay on the property that they're hunting. And, and certainly there's some people who might, be a little free with that, but I think most of the bear hunters recognize that that their heritage, their heritage and, and tradition, you know, relies upon them being good actors and, and, and doing what they can to to follow the laws. Thank you. Any other questions for Mark? All right, we'll continue. All right, so I got to turn my mic on here. Um, <clears throat> So before we get into deer and turkeys, I did want to just provide a high level background refresher again on this adaptive harvest management and all the work we've done. And as, as Chief Benedict said, this this has been a tremendous amount of work. We've been working on it for a few years. So we're really excited to kind of show the whole picture now and talk about, you know, what our season recommendations are. Um, so hopefully I can do this rather quickly, but kind of tie it all together so you understand how everything fits together. So the first thing we did was was create these units that are based on biology. And so you can see here, here's all the drivers that we identified. We know there's a lot of landscape factors that are very important to how deer and turkey populations behave. Um, a lot of these are more important than harvest, but we did include harvest in these because we know, you know, we want to identify those areas where harvest, but also all the dry, all the other drivers of population are similar. And the idea there is if we can hold this much similar, as much kind of constant as possible, it's easier to parse out what impacts from harvest might be and what might, what other factors might be influencing populations. So it's really designed to help us understand what's going on with deer and turkey populations and what role we might be having in that with hunting regulations. So <clears throat> once we created these units, um, we assembled some focus groups. These were stakeholders from the public, partners, um, over 60 different individuals who met 24 times across the state and really helped us flesh out what are our foundational objectives for deer and turkey management? What do we want to accomplish? What does the public want us to consider when we're setting regulations for deer and turkeys? And so we took all those objectives. We let the commission, we let staff and some others actually go in and prioritize and weight those objectives. And we did that by unit because we know that across the state, some people's values and objectives might be different than on other parts of the state. So here's a list of those objectives. These are, again, just kind of the foundational overarching goals. Um, and, and I just want to point out here for both deer and turkeys, the, the number one objective is the resource, right? That was universal. Folks are like, hey, we got to take care of the resource. If we're doing that, then let's maximize opportunity. Let's make stakeholders as happy as we can. But at the end of the day, we need to take care of the resource. Um, so once we have these objectives in mind, we need to know, okay, well, how can we meet those goals? What are all the different decisions we can make, options we can take to meet those objectives? And specifically here, we're talking about regulation packages, hunting season. So 
we went out to the public um, with some draft regulation packages that those focus groups had assembled. And when we first went to the public, you can see the deer ones here. There's five packages. I think we had nine, nine or 10 packages that we presented to the public. We got feedback from the public on them. We posted one of those videos online, set up a tool where people could give us input and push that out on social media and emails and said, hey, come tell us what you think about these packages. Which ones do you like, not like, et cetera? And so we took all that feedback. We got about 1,600 different individuals comment on it. We took all that feedback and scaled down those packages. So we had a, a finite number of packages that were somewhat different. The packages have to be different so that the model can say, oh, yeah, harvest is different from this package to that package. If they're all similar, then it can't really decide. So those were the deer packages. Here's the turkey packages. Um, we talked about these in January, and we can come back and talk about these at the end if you'd like. Um, so now we got, now that we have all these packages and objectives, this is when kind of all the hard science went into this. We worked with Tennessee tech. They really had the expertise, the theoretical modeling, the math, and then our biologists are really the on the ground, the expertise with deer and turkeys. So we kind of, it was really cool to see the synergy come together with these two different skill sets to really flesh out this last part. So what we did was, was unit specific modeling where we said, okay, for any given regulation package, what do we think the impact on the season is going to be? So we predicted an actual impact of implementing a hunting season. And then we looked at that impact and we tied it to the objectives. So if this is the impact, how well are we meeting our objectives? And the result of that is this unit specific decision tool that tells us for any given decision, for any given population status that we have, here's the decision that you should make that's going to best meet your objectives. And so every year we can go in and say, okay, here's all of our population data, put it in that population status data into the decision tool. And it will kind of tell us, Hey, here's the optimal decision. So this is just an example of, you know, a deer management tool. So if we say we have a fawn doe ratio of about one, maybe the deer density is a little higher than 20 you know, I put that circle there, that's our population status. And all that math and modeling is tying everything together and saying, okay, well, based on this population, the productivity and the density of your population, so not only where it is, but where it's going, how many animals are coming into it, this is the hunting season that's going to best meet those objectives. And again, those objectives, number one, taking care of the resource. The impact of this regulation is not going to negatively impact the resource. And then secondly, we're maximizing hunter opportunity and satisfaction. So before I go on, I, this is my favorite part of this whole process. And I think one of the, the large benefits of moving to this framework, because we're making all these predictions every year of, of what we think the impact is going to be, we're, all, we're also collecting that data after the season. So we can go back and say, okay, well, here's what we predicted was going to happen, but here's what actually happened. And, and then we go back into these models and adjust the models so that through time, our predictions are better matching what's actually happening on the ground. So we're making better decisions through time and we're learning what, what things and what aspects of hunting seasons might be driving populations. So this is really, you know, forward looking. So I do just want to hit, I've talked about that process now a few times, but I've never really explicitly said why we believe this is better and why we're so you know, we've been talking about this and so encouraged about moving in this framework. So the first thing is the units. The units are kind of the foundation of this. So we know there's all these other things that impact deer and turkey populations. We talk about them all the time, habitat, predators. Um, and so one of the ideas of these units, like I said, is, is to hold, you know, of all those things that we have good data on and, and, you know, the big ones that don't change much like soil productivity and percent farmland or percent pasture land, hold those as similar as possible so that it's easier to parse out what impacts, what other things might be impacting those populations specifically, you know, hunting seasons for one. Um, but there's also a, you know, a forward looking and kind of a monitoring, monitoring aspect to this. So we're monitoring productivity in abundance through time at these unit levels. And, you know, we always have these conversations about predator control and, and initiatives or strategies to improve habitat. And with this framework, we'll actually be able to measure success with those initiatives. Are we having a landscape scale improvement on productivity or abundance in these units through time with some of these other strategies? 
Uh, so that's that's kind of looking forward. One of the really exciting things about how we design this whole structure, um, <clears throat> specifically for these season recommendations. You know, science sets the season. This we're using way more science than we've ever used before. You know, typically it's looking at harvest data and, and kind of trying to follow trends there. Well, harvest may be a little down. Is something going on with the population? Maybe we could be a little more conservative. But now we're using abundance and productivity, so we're looking forward. And so this is really ahead of the curve. We're not looking in the rearview mirror what harvest did. We're looking at on the ground, here's what the density of, of the animals are, and here's what productivity has done. So even if density is down a little bit, but you have a few good years of productivity, you know a bunch more animals are coming onto the landscape. So you can, you know you can provide more opportunity in those scenarios. Um, and then from the public side of things, this is driven by objectives. As I said, you know, the overarching goals kind of dictate what season gets selected because we have to be meeting the objectives that the stakeholders and the focus groups identified. Um, and so within that, like I said earlier, we're, you know, we're really maximizing opportunity for any given population status while protecting the resource. Um, and then kind of just this whole trans, it's a transparent process, how we select a season. We know exactly why, here's what the density was. Here's what the model told us to select and it's repeatable. So if we know how and why we made a decision, we can go back and make that same decision in that same scenario. So with that, I'm just going to get right into the deer stuff. I've got kind of a high level background of harvest and we'll talk about CWD a little bit and then I'll just get right into the season proposals for deer. So <clears throat> total deer harvest reported deer harvest this year, slightly above the five year average, kind of within that normal variation. You can see it bounce up and down there. Um, We've been showing this slide the last few years. If you look at the star I've got on the bottom there, 2015 was the first year that we went from three bucks down to two bucks for the statewide bag limit. And you can see since then, there's been a, a slow but steady improvement in age structure of bucks that have been harvested. Um, and, and it looks like the two and a half year old bucks might've leveled out a little bit, but those three and a half and four and a half year old bucks are, are still slowly creeping up. So that's, that's really cool to see the success of that regulation. Um, <clears throat> unit CWD, there's, 21,650 deer harvested this year. Um, I do want to note, you know, at the bottom there, we've got the number of counties that were incorporated in the unit CWD. So you can't really look at this as a linear graph. So for that reason, we used a three year average because the last three years, there's been 12 counties in unit CWD. You can see there we're right at about the three year average. <clears throat> Speaking of CWD, um, our test results from this from this past hunting season. This is really our sampling year. So this is from July 1st of last year. So far we've sampled 16,000, just over 16,000 deer. There's still some pending. Um, you know, we're still picking up roadkill and re responding to sick deer reports and, and stuff like that. So we're still collecting and sampling deer. Um, but most county quotas have been met or exceeded. There's seven counties that have not met their quotas, but I think four of those seven are within 95%. So functionally they've about met their quota. Um, so of all those samples, we've had 733 positive detections this year. Um, but as usual, 90% of those positives occurred in our core area, which is Fayette and Hardman County. So you can see there, there are 663 positives um, in those two counties. So I, I just wanna talk about a few notable detections we had this year. The first big one was obviously Lewis County. This was the first detection east of the river, and it was also the first detection in Lewis County. Uh, moving to Hardin County, Hardin County has, has detections before, but this was the first one also east of the river. So we've had two second detections. Um, their, their previous detections were 2021. So <clears throat> I do want to take this opportunity to thank the commission, thank our partners at the uh, foundation for healthy work base. And I'm gonna brag on our staff a little bit here in these next few slides when I talk about the work base and the workflow and, and everything that goes into collecting these samples um, and, and running the CWD program. So specific to the work base, planning and design started back in November of 2021. It was completed in July of this year and it was up and operational during the, the deer season. Um, so you can see the base there, there's a crematorium where they dispose of all the deer. Um, and I'll talk numbers in a little bit. And it's, it's pretty impressive to see how many animals come through this place. <clears throat> so here's a, just a map of all of our 
sample collection location. So you can see there, we work with over 50 different partners um, between processors and taxidermists. And we also have drop-off freezers located throughout the CWD affected zone. And every week our staff drive routes to each one of those processors, each one of those taxidermists and each one of those freezers to pick up samples. You can see the numbers here, region one staff, they're driving just over 3000 miles a week, region two staff, just shy of 700. Um, so almost 4,000 miles a week that, that our CWD folks spend behind the windshield going, working with partners, talking to people on the ground and picking up samples. Um, so in an average week, they're picking up about 750 samples, but that's just the beginning. They got to get those back to the lab, process them, sort them, get all the data entered, ship them, make sure all the shipping is tied to all the data and everything's in order. Um, and so at the heart of muzzleloader and gun season, you can see there's, there's about a solid two months where they're processing over a, a, a thousand samples a week during Thanksgiving week, everyone's relaxed and taking time off. They processed over 2000 samples. Um, they work long days, they work hard, long hours. By the end of deer season, they're exhausted, but they do a phenomenal job. Um, and that's just the field side. Then we've got the data side. They're helping sort, do quality assurance and all this data. Once we get lab results back, they're emailing each hunter with their test results. They're calling hunters to verify locations, talk about any discrepancies they're seeing in the data, just make sure that everything's in order. Um, and so this whole program gets run and the average test turn turnaround time is 10 days. Um, and even with working with partners and, and handling all this data and all these samples, there's very few, if any, lost samples, missing data. Um, the, the quality assurance and quality control on this program is tremendous. So I did just want to take this opportunity to kind of brag on them and, and highlight all the work that goes into this. So <clears throat> Now we're going to kind of trans transition to the deer proposals. And before I show them, I did just want to put a little, hopefully informative slide up here and, and one that's pre pretty easy to see. And so what I really want you to look at is those pie graphs, those pie charts uh, along the bottom there. So the two on the left, unit L and unit CWD, this is the amount of does in successful hunters bags in those two units. And we know the, the, Antlerless regulations are very liberal in, in these areas. You can shoot three a day for the entire season. And so, you know, just looking at unit L, it's like, okay, about 65% of our hunt successful hunters will shoot one, 20 or so percent are shooting two. So about 85% of our hunters shoot two deer, two antlerless deer or less. Um, unit CWD, those 66% of our hunters shoot two, or 86% of our hunters shoot two or less. When you move over to units A, B, C, and D, where we, we do have a lot more restrictive antler, you see a slight shift, but it's functionally, it's about the same, right? So there we go up to 87% of our hunters shoot two does or less. And so I, I really put this up here to highlight that the regulations aren't driving a vast difference in, in antlerless harvest. Hunters are shooting the same amount of deer in general, you know? And so the, when we put all these historic harvest rates and historic data into these models, that really kind of got parsed out. And it was like, well, there's really not much difference between this package, this package, and this package. So it's really helped us consolidate how many seasons are across the state. So we currently have six units with six different hunting packages. Um, and so when we ran the modeling this year, this is the result that we got. And it's so we, we you know, we still have six units with the new man, deer management units. Oh but it's only recommending two different packages across the state. Um, so before I talk about the specific pass packages, just at a high level, the buck bag limit's going to stay the same um, two across the state statewide. So if you shoot a buck in unit one, you can go to another unit, shoot another one, but you can't shoot two bucks in each unit. It's a statewide bag limit. Um, and then earn a buck because there's no longer a unit CWD earn a buck, earn a buck, which is a disease mitigation measure. Um, is just going to apply at the CWD positive counties, um, just in those counties that are affected by CWD. And so <laughs> you can see in our chart here, really the structure of the seasons is the same. The start date, same as we currently have um, for all these time periods. So really the only difference across these units is, is just the antlerless bag limits. So for middle and west Tennessee, those antlerless bag limits are staying where they are currently, which is three per day. Um, and then across East Tennessee, the antlerless bag limits would be 
Um, four during archery, two during muzzleloader, and two during gun. Um, and then young sportsmen would say the same at two. So it's it's much simpler and cleaner than what we have currently. Um, and and so we're we're pretty excited to simplify regulations and hopefully get some some new hunters feeling that this isn't as intimidating as they thought. So I'm going to roll on to turkeys and then we'll just open the conversation at the end of this. This should be pretty quick. So turkeys, <clears throat> this pr the last spring, um, there's almost 32,000 turkeys killed. And if you look at the graph over time, you know, our average is about 33. It's pretty much a straight line. There's annual variation in there, which is what we would expect. Um, but I did want to point out that through that time, we've gone from a four bird bag limit to a three bird bag limit to a two bird bag limit and, and harvest has stayed about the same. And so we did a similar breakdown that we did with deer. Well, how are turkey hunters harvesting turkeys? And so, you know, <clears throat> if you just look across there, it's about 83% are shooting. Yeah. 83% are shooting two or less when it was four, when it was three, it was slightly higher about 70 percent or 90 percent there um and then two birds obviously everyone shot two birds but the point is is very few guys are shooting more than two birds the bulk of our hunters shoot regardless of the bag limits are shooting two or less um and so what essentially that that is that is telling the model that hey there's really not much difference between a bag limit of you know three or two because there's not that many guys who normally shoot to here's what the harvest rates are. Um, and so that'll make a little more sense in a second. And so for pulse, for pulse per hen, which is really kind of one of the drivers that we're basing this off of, we just wanted to put this chart up here so you could see what productivity has done. This is a three year average last three years of, of pulse per hen with turkeys across these units. Um, and I want you to look at that number 2.5. So 2.5 is kind of the magic number where it's like, Hey, we're at 2.5, we're doing good, population staying where it is, slightly growing, you know, we're not concerned. Um, you know, a little, it's a little below 2.5, 2 we're still not slightly, you know, we're, we're not super concerned, but really we're looking at that 2.5 number. So you can see most of our units, with the exception of the central and the northeast, are, are right about there. Northeast is slightly lower than central. Um, and so when we, we put all this pull per hen data into our decision tools and our model, um, this is what we got. So <clears throat> because the, the productivity has been pretty good in most of our units, it did recommend that we had a three bird season for every unit, but the Northeast. Um, so <clears throat> we do want to kind of explain how the statewide bag limit would work. So there would be a statewide bag limit of three, which is going to be the highest unit that we had, the, the highest unit bag limit. So you can harvest your statewide bag limit from any combination of the management units, um, but you can't exceed the bag limit of a turkey management unit. So in other words, if you're in the Northeast zone and, and your limit is two, you can shoot two, but then you can go over to central and, and shoot a third. And so we're also recommending a fall season with these packages. And you can see that fall season there. Uh, the framework is the same as we currently have with a six week archery season, and then two week gun season. Um, but there's a slight change to the bag limit. We would go to one bearded turkey statewide. It's currently one per county. But I think when, when our turkey coordinator looked at the numbers, there was six individuals that had harvested a turkey in more than one county. Um, so we felt that just for simplification, it would be easier just, hey, if you want to shoot a bird in the fall, that's great. Just one statewide in the fall. So that's it. Well. Thank you once again, Mark, uh, for the fabulous presentation and all the information and work that your staff has put into this and uh, balancing opportunity with science and uh, just, you know, makes uh, makes it a lot, you know, simp simplicity is always a good thing. And, and we really appreciate all y'all's hard work. So I'll turn it over to Commissioner uh, Wright to uh, take the commission's questions. Can't believe you forgot my name. Uh, uh, commissioner, I'll just open up to all commissioners that have any questions uh, for Mark, and then uh, I'll turn it back over to you after that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I can't remember your name uh, for public comment. Commissioner Butt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there any way, Mark, going forward that uh, we 
could ask volunteer information from the fur bearing hunters uh, when they take bobcats or coyotes to see if we could add that data into uh, the assessment of uh, population and yeah. see if, if that would affect it at all. Like I know bobcats uh, are destructive on turkey populations. They also destructive on fawns. Uh, coyotes more destructive on uh, on pools and uh, maybe on mature birds. So if, if that data could be phased into the consideration to see if there was any noticeable change, uh, possibly. We could certainly look at that. It, it, that gets accounted for a, a little bit with the way the models are set up already because we're looking at productivity. And, and that's one of those areas where if there's really high predation and you know, nest predation and young poult predation, you're going to see just naturally lower yeah. poults per hand. So it gets accounted for a little bit how we're setting it up. But the, the other cool thing about this whole model framework is it, we can add anything and everything and, and play with it and learn through time. Well, I know there are lots of other factors in counting raccoons and armadillos and, and depending on species, particularly turkeys and nest and quail. Uh, did I see the time frame for the fall turkey season it says six weeks but it didn't say when so it's the same as it is currently which i think it's the the archery runs during the whole archery season. deer season and then it would just be shotgun right after that okay. and and i don't have the exact dates up so I, I asked a question i don't remember whether it's first year or last year about uh, allowing possibility of taking one of the fall turkeys during Thanksgiving week or as close to it as, as we could get. Uh, if we could maybe look at that again uh, for consideration for traditional, those people who would want to take a wild turkey for Thanksgiving dinner, uh, that question had been asked of me a time or two. Yes, sir. We can look at that. That was, you know, when we took these, these packages out to the public and got input, that was not something that we heard from the public at, at those meetings. Um, but we, we can certainly look at it and we're going to point people to this conversation and, and hopefully, you know, get good feedback and hopefully they'll stay on these presentations and listen to the discussion and provide input on it. Thank you. Mr. Blue. Thank you there, Commissioner Wright. What, hey, I know we're going from two to three birds. I know the percentages you were telling me, but I got a little confused. What, what, how many more birds or how many less birds are we saving? on the ground if, if we don't or if we do go to that what's the difference i know you said the percentage of hunters is what but how many birds is that what are we talking about do we know we don't know and i and i think it's really not many so that's just the percentages of how it's distributed but if you look at the total harvest it's staying about the same so some of that is also affected by diminishing returns so at towards the end of the season there's way less turkeys on okay. on the landscape so that guy who might have shot, shot three might not when there's two. Okay. Uh, last question I, I got for you. Could you go back to the, the deer seasons when the deer seasons were going to start again? Yes, sir. So, okay. I was just wanting to look at those a minute. No real question, but. So the, the the dates aren't changing then. We're not changing anything on the dates. Then. It's no, all no, the sir. same dates. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. One more question. Mr. Butt. Uh, are we still allowing one Jake out of the three birds? Is it Jake's would be allowed up to up to three, up to your up or two, depending on what your bag limit is. Um, and that was another thing that we solicited input from the public on how they feel about that. And really when we looked at the data, it was like, you know, Jake harvest was I think 11 or 12% bag limit was four and you could shoot as many Jake's as you want. And then we went to the one Jake restriction and it was like 9%. So there's really functionally very little change there um, because most folks, if they are shooting a Jake, they're just shooting one. So just for simplification, ease of regulations, getting new folks out there, people aren't worried about, Oh, well I shot a Jake already. Is that a Jake? I'm not sure. I'm not going to shoot it. Um, just to hopefully increase participation because there isn't a large biological difference there. Um, we landed with j just Jake's allowed up to your up to your bag limit. 
Let me call on Commissioner Childers first. Hey, could you break the harvest down by these seven, one, two, three, four, five regions? You know, you show a statewide harvest staying the same. Could it be broke down to West, Midwest, and, yeah, I'd, and see if it would cor correlate to the the poult survival? Yes. You understand what we, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, we could do that. And one thing I will note on that, too, actually, that's interesting is we did a we did a turkey. It was a um, turkey opinions and attitude survey. And, and in that, we asked folks, you know, at organized at this unit level, what how do you feel about your turkey population? And folks in the West, which has the highest pulse per hand, were the most optimistic, said, we see a ton of turkeys. Tur our turkeys are increasing. They're doing great. Folks in the Northeast, which has the lowest pulse per hand, were the most discouraged about the state of their turkeys, feeling like that they were declining. You do realize we've been in the delay season for several years, and they hadn't been in the Southeast. Yeah. Southwest, South, North, whatever, Northeast. You do realize <laughs> that part of it too, right? Yeah. Commissioner Davenport. Kind of springboarding off um, Wally's point. My question was, it's just a, a great disparity in 3.6 and 2.5 pulse per hen there from the West through Central through Southeast. Can you just give us an idea of what you think that is, or do you all know at this point? Roger, I'm going to attempt this, and he can he can fill in any gaps. But I, I think the one of the main thoughts that the West is is actually high because post flooding there was a huge flush of productivity, um, a lot of early successional habitat as as that disturbance shook up you know the the landscape a little bit which we see that a lot anytime there's a large disturbance to habitat things come back really productive so i think that's the conventional thinking there roger do you have anything to add to that thanks mark roger shields walter you program coordinator um the only thing I would really add, he, he, he explained it pretty well, just what's going on the far side, the west side of the state and the flooding and the impacts from that. But um, I would just add to that, there's, as he was talking about, there's other components that impact the productivity and habitat can be such an important part of that. And just getting areas um, where there's lots of trees and having open areas that provide that brood cover. That's what's driving all of this is the ability to have good brooding cover to support that productivity. And I, I really think that some of this is being driven by, as he explained, the, the impacts that were occurring in the Western part of the state were really driving really excellent brooding habitat. So it's not so much that the other part of the state is bad, but that we just saw some really good years um, on the Western side of the state. Thank you, Mark. I think the agency has set a map for the next two decades on how to manage our deer and turkey with this plan, and I commend you all for that. Thank you. Another question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Butts, do, uh, do we see any significant difference central primarily from the Tier counties where we had the two-week delay of, of pool production versus northern counties like murray county and bedford and those counties as we go north is any increase Can, do we have that as far as the data collection we would have a little of that roger you probably know that data um well, i i do know that they the university of tennessee did not find a significant increase in productivity with that delay um, between the control counties and the treatment counties but most of those control areas or the the study areas were confined to the southern tier right Those, yeah, yes and and as you move forward it seems to be that there's an increase in pulse as you go north and right. i'd like to know if there's any any significance of difference in the data Okay, again, um, the study only looked at those five counties. We don't have data to a county level for productivity measures from a summer survey. Um, so to, 
to try and address that question. We don't have the information to, to go to that scale to try and determine if things went, um, as you went north, if we had better productivity. So from the hunter input or when we asked the hunters to report about their sightings and then pulls, did we notice any significant difference there from the input that we received? Well, we don't analyze it at that scale. We, we, we have to take all the observations and, and pool them by these units. So we look at them at a unit scale. We don't get enough reports to be able to look at them county by county. Or would we just didn't try to do that. It, could we identify where those reports came from? Like I reported on Murray County and, and you know, that's a significant part, or at least we take more birds than, than a lot of other counties do. Right. And, and we, we get, we do know what county the reports come from, but some of the counties are one or three. Uh, some of the counties will get a hundred. And so we just, we pull them together, look at them more regionally rather than try and look at county versus county. Okay. So from the data, from the studies, then observations on hens where they had no pulse versus hens that had five or, or more than we have that data. I mean, like, you them. know, within a, a mile radius of my house and I, I know three hens had at least eight to 10 pulse. And so I'm just wondering if there's any way to analyze that type of data in those other counties <clears throat> or would it be of any significant need to do that well we really want to have enough observations that we have confidence in what the estimate comes out as but we could go back and try and look at um you know broader groupings of counties or something along those lines see if there was a change from north to south so i guess from harvest standpoint does the number of harvest birds indicate the more production that we have in those counties is that one factor that we can take from all of the data? I would say that harvest is multi affected by many different things. Productivity being a, a strong driver, but just the general density of birds in an area is going to be another important driver of that. And the central part of the state has much higher density of birds than any of the other, whether the east or the west. And so that's why you see a lot of higher harvest in the central part. Well, yeah, and an effort on top of that, there can be as a bunch of turkeys in the you know in an area, but if no one's hunting there, it's going to say, hey, there's not a lot of harvest. So it, it's using harvest alone can be a little perilous at times. So in the early consideration or the concern was that why was the population declining in those counties like Giles, Lincoln, and and Lawrence and and those tier counties, and so our our data from a delayed standpoint didn't indicate that that was the case. It was cyclical, was it not? I mean, the populations uh, came back. Well, that they recovered. That 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 um, the timing of the season did not have an impact on the reproduction. That's what the study was suggesting. Yes, yes. but from a population standpoint, you know, all we heard was we don't have as many birds as we've had. You know. You know, I can tell you from Murray County, 20 years ago, I used to see 200 birds in the fall together in the field. And now, you know, you may see 25 or 50 at the, at the max. Uh, and so has any consideration been given to agricultural practices or any other factors that, that lend to the reduction in numbers? That certainly is in the model, the, the amount of ag land and the, the amount of land in crops versus the amount of land in forested cover versus open habitat. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cox. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Um, I think you've got the turkey recommendation. Great. I think it's perfect. I have a question and then a comment. On the earn a buck, it's only in CWD County, designated counties. Why would we not why would we not have earn a buck statewide? If somebody killed a CWD buck in Lewis County or something that's outside of the CWD, why wouldn't we give 
him the opportunity to take a doe and then earn a buck and then you replace the buck on top of that. So for replace their CWD buck. Yeah. So we, we do have replacement buck anywhere in the state currently. Oh, so if, if you take a positive buck anywhere, even if it's a new detection in East Tennessee, you okay, know, I thought you said it was just CWD. That's just earn a buck, which is, which is, which is where you, if you shoot a doe, submit it right. for testing, then you can shoot an additional buck. The replacement buck is still in place statewide. Would we not benefit by earn a buck everywhere? I mean, uh, yeah, earn a buck everywhere. Uh, from, from what we've heard from the public, they're not interested in that. I think, you know, when we, when we showed that the graph of statewide harvest and the, the buck age structure is increasing, Folks are happy with the two buck okay. bag limit statewide. All right, thanks. I'm I'm going to renew my deep concern about the changes in the season for the CWD areas. The the the, the many people that I've talked to like the season like it is. They are have the opportunity to take more deer. Now you say they're not, but I think that if we if you change it back, I think you're going to kill fewer. But I'm concerned it sends the wrong message. Um, and, and, and I know we've had discussions about that and I just think it sends the wrong message to the hunters that we, that, that the science that we have been preaching for five, six, seven years, however long, which I think you guys have done a great job developing the plan, the program. And we, we've done so much. I think if you, if we take that away, we're, seem to be telling the hunters that okay well we were wrong we're not going to require you to do anything different than anybody else so like we're not concerned about it anymore and i just think it's a mistake even though i like what you're doing with the 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 uh, season setting and the way you're developing it i think cwd is a wild card and i don't think we need to change it back to to, to be the same thanks mr box can you give us some more detail about what was asked um, among hunters in in the CWD area and regarding method of take, uh, length of season, and what they said, and maybe details of what they were asked? Yes, sir. So we actually, if you go, and I'll just go back there, when we when we went to the public with these all these draft packages which is way up here so give me a second here um so we went with these draft packages to the public and as i said there was i think nine or ten deer and we had the full cwd package in there um and we went to each region around the state met with those folks and said okay here's all these packages and one of those was unit cwd um as it is currently with the extended season gun during uh muzzleloader and we just sat there and had conversations with the folks. And then we also live streamed one of those public meetings and pointed folks to it, go watch it and go give us your thoughts on these specific packages. So we specifically asked, what do you think about hunting during muzzleloader season? What do you think about the length of gun season? And, and we actually broke that down by unit level two with responses. And the folks in West Tennessee said they want their seasons to end at the same time as the other hunters do. Um, they like the tradition of muzzleloader. They want to get it back. Um, and so initially we were like, you know, pump the brakes. We don't know if we can do that. Let's go look at the data and see what's happening with harvest over there. And when we started digging into that harvest and we saw hunters are shooting essentially same amount of deer. So if you look at, and I don't have the graph here, but if you look at harvest and unit CWD through time, it's, you know, as these additional opportunities been, have been added, there hasn't been a sharp increase in the amount of deer taken. Um, and, and I suspect it's the opposite. What we heard from a lot of these hunters was you guys are pushing us to kill all the deer. We're not shooting any deer because we think everyone else is. And there's kind of this concern over there that the agency's pushed everyone to shoot deer and everyone's doing it so that they don't want to be part of that. Um, so one, we wanted to do what the hunters wanted. They said, Hey, this is how we want our season set up. There's still ample opportunity to take deer throughout the season. Um, but two, we're hoping that we can gain a little trust with the hunters. Hey, this is what your season looks like. You still have opportunity to take deer. We're still serious about CWD. We're going to revamp some of our education and, and outreach efforts to help people understand why we want them to take more deer. And that it's not this 
kill mall mentality, but we just need to reduce the density a little bit to slow the spread. So hopefully that, that answered your question well, a little bit. It yeah. does, but it, it kind of seems in conflict with at least the hunters I've talked to. So okay. uh, to the, to the extent we can, I would love to see some of that data and understand it because I agree with you. We have to, we have to listen to the hunters and, and respond to what they ultimately want. And, and I guess I'm surprised to hear that as, as a response from them. Yes, sir. We can, we can certainly get that together. We have it from the January meeting. Um, so I can, I can, I can put some of that back together. Um, and then uh, just another reminder as well, we're going to point people to this presentation and, and have them give us direct feedback on these proposals. So we will have more input from, from folks through that as well. Okay. Commissioner Blue. Uh, one last question. What, what, what input from hunters did you get from your surveys on um, extending or the six week turkey season? Did you have any interest in shortening the season or anything along those lines? No, not much. You know, it, most folks like the traditional length um, and felt that it provided the, the most opportunity. Um, there was uh, over, over what, I mean, overall, do we show most, when most want, of the birds are killed. I, I would, especially in our dominant bird delayed bird. season. I mean, most of the birds are killed the first two weeks, aren't they? Yeah. First, first three, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly front heavy. And part of that is, is pressure. Part of that's diminishing returns. There's just a lot less birds on the landscape available for harvest. Yeah. I would love to see, I, I don't know. I would love to see how many birds that we've had killed in the last two weeks of the season or last week of the season. You know, I've heard a lot of turkey hunters say just from my personal input, they wouldn't mind a shorter season. And I'm not saying a drastically shorter season, but a week shorter, maybe even a week and a half shorter something along those lines. Uh, and I don't know if that would make that big a difference in our turkey population, obviously. But um, yeah. um, just wondered what your thoughts were on that, a shorter season, and, and what difference that would make on the population. Yeah, I think I think population-wise, it, it wouldn't make much difference. I don't think we have any evidence of that. I mean, if you, if you look at Kentucky, their season is only three weeks, and they kill about 30,000 turkeys every year. Um, you know, it being a, a state pretty similar to us. So I think harvest wise wouldn't make an opportunity, but what we heard from the public certainly was folks like six weeks for, for the length of season um, to be able to hunt later if they didn't get their birds early. Mark, if, if you don't mind, could you go back to the slide where you had the number of processors, number of taxidermists, number of freezers? Well, that's a long way back and I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Where is it? Went the wrong way there. I'd written down 24 processors, 28 taxidermists. Yes, sir. And 55, 55 drop-off freezers. Yeah. So we're maintaining those and 4,000 miles a week with personnel driving for another three or four weeks during January. <coughs> when the data shows we're probably not killing more deer, we're just spreading out the time frame that we kill the same number of deer or close. That's, that's right. a lot of expense, but the question I had, that's a statement, sorry. But the question I have is about processors. Do we have any data on how many processors are not open in January? Like, do they shut down early because they're not getting many deer? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I've had that complaint sure like, hey, I'd like to go. I don't even have a processor that's open. We can't control yeah. that. But Yeah, if Jer Jeremy Dennison, our CWD field coordinator, if he's here, he may have stepped outside. He can get that answer for us because he's the one who travels around to all these processors and works closely with them to get samples. Yeah, just curious. That's an enormous effort. Just pointing that out, especially if there's a diminishing return. Uh, anything else from the commission? Commissioner Butt. Is there any to any of our management, any uh possibility of getting additional dollars for processors for uh, collection of, of deer and processing of deer? I, I don't think at this time we're kind of maxed out with our capability of, of, of dollars spent and the amount of samples that, I mean, we're grossly oversampling in a lot of those core areas. Um, so we don't really need more samples. We want to, what resources we have, we want to allocate to make sure we're, we're meeting hunters needs and that, you know, if they want their deer tested, they can get it tested. 
so are we going to offer that consideration in Fayette and in, uh, in Hardeman counties? If we know that those are the two high positive areas, why are we testing deer in those areas? Uh, it's a service to the public so that hunters that harvest deer are able to get theirs tested if, if they're concerned. Okay. All right, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman, if you want to ask for public comment on this. Thank you. Uh, you know, when when you're when we were younger and you were in trouble, your mother always called you by your first two names. So, thank you, David Hank, and uh, we'll uh, we'll move forward. And I'll invite anybody from the public that would like to come up and make a comment relative to deer and turkey. If I could, could I give you each one of y'all something, a packet that I've worked on? And it kind of goes with what everybody has said. Can you identify yourself, please? Anthony Landreth. I'm with Tennessee Outside. I'm from Bolivar, Tennessee. Thanks, sir. What it is, it's pretty much, it's crude. I mean, it's handwritten, but uh, these are the things I do for the show every week. But if, you, if anybody's been on Facebook, and I'm sure y'all have heard it, uh, they all thought that Unit CWD was going to slaughter deer from day one. Well, what I've done right here, it shows that hasn't been the case as all the studies that TWRA has done. Exact same thing. And, and I'll just kind of tell you, because you can look at it, you know, because just to think about it, but the top half of every sheet is unit CWD, velvet hunt, and muzzle loader. And but some of the muzzle loader is rifle, some of the velvet is muzzle loader and rifle. And you'll be kind of shocked on some of them because when we was using rifles and muzzle loaders, the, the top eight counties or 12, whatever was in unit CWD, they was killing twice as many as we were with, with the bow and arrow, with archery. And, but that's why I did that because on the show, so many people say that. And I just want to clear things up on that. But the thing that worries me about this is Commissioner Cox and, and Commissioner Box said it a while ago. You know, after the January meeting, when all the proposals came in, in, in probably five days, I had probably approximately 50 people that they, they sent me a text or call me, most of them Facebook message messenger and a lot of them i don't even know and they said well i guess cd is not as bad as it you know as the agency let on to be and i said no it, it's just the opposite it's worse i said fayette county is pushing 25 percent hardeman's pushing 20 uh shelby which was you know kind of shocked you know it's pushing five percent right now and all the studies that, that, that I've looked at and biologists I've talked to throughout the United States, because, I mean, I, I kind of I, I enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy doing this kind of stuff. But at 25 percent, pretty much from each year it goes on after that, you're looking at three to five percent more getting it every year. I mean, and that, that's a pretty big cost. And just by listening until Commissioner Cox spoke up a while ago, it seems like it's nothing kind of like. And I don't mean this, but no disrespect, but it's as if CWD is not on the spotlight no more on the front page. And that, that's what that kind of got me concerned because this little book that the agency put out, I'll show you the front of it, but put out about that. The number one tool to help CWD that it's always been was to reduce the harvest by these latest proposals up here. You know, and, you, and I know they say the harvest will stay the same, but I disagree. It's going to re totally reduce the harvest. Now, as to how much y'all want to reduce it by, but by closing it all like the first Sunday of January, if you took unit CWD and you closed it January the 8th or whatever it is, the, last, uh, the first Sunday, and you take out the youth hunt, just in the last two years, that's 40 4,800, I've got it wrote down here. I probably have to put my glasses on to read it. But it's uh, right at 4,800 deer that was taken like that. 
I mean, that's a lot of deer, 4,864 just in that time frame. Okay, if you take away the rifle deer and velvet, which if you look, see what we kill first year with the muzzleloader, we only could kill 63. But the thing about in unit CWD, the people using a rifle, they're not going out there to shoot the little basket rack, small bucks, you know, like if he was out there with a the bow in the rest of the state. But they are taking some of your bigger, older deer. Because I know the year they killed 63, I think one of my buddies, taxidermist, he got 31 of those deer. And they were all good deer. There wasn't no just little spikes, four points, and not knocking them if that's somebody wants to kill. But if you're going to use a rifle, well, the thing about that, according to all the CWD studies, your older bucks is one that's most likely to carry CWD throughout the rest of the state and other counties. So what does it hurt to take them off early like that? Same way when muzzleloader starts up, well, it's it's still, it, you know, for muzzleloader, you know, they changed it over where we could use rifle during the muzzleloader season. If you look at the numbers, I mean, the top eight counties or 12 counties, they were still slaughtering them compared to what we was. But if you go back to muzzleloader and you go back to archery during the velvet and unit CWD, those harvest numbers are going to drop. So, I guess my question, are you saying that the reduction of harvest now is, is not going to matter? I mean, I'm just curious. I wonder. Because, I mean, so many people, when this first come out, I, and still everybody was saying, man, what do you know? So we don't need to worry about CWD no more. And the thing of all the, a lot of the complaints, I'm not going to say complaints. I mean, that's the wrong word. When, when um, the agency asked for input, some of the things that, that, that I've heard, I've not heard a single person that wants to change it. And that's between myself, Officer Spencer, that is, you know, game warden. You know, he and I do a show together. J.R. Sweat, he does the shows in uh, McNary and Hardin County on the radio. Tim Rixey, taxidermist, and I check with all of them. We have not heard one person in Unit CWD that's for these new changes. I mean, not one. Now, I can tell you the ones that are wanting the changes, all the counties north of unit CWD, because a lot of the, some of those counties have positive. And the big disconnect is they get confused on the CWD management zone versus unit CWD. I can promise you the week before uh, the, the youth hunt till probably Thanksgiving, minimum 100 people a day call me or ask me questions because they're confused about when their season is going to open. So I can understand changing some of it, but I think some of the changes it's going to in the public side, they're going to lose the focus on the CWD. And if you, you take about people from middle Tennessee, which I, you know, this is my opinion because the one thing I've got a lot of friends over there and talk to them. It's like, they're kind of jealous because we can use rifle during velvet and muzzle loader. I mean, rifle during muzzle loader. And I tell them every time we would love to swap CWD. Y'all have it and us not have it. I mean, it, it's a, um, it's a curse. I mean, does it change the way we hunt? If you love to hunt, we still go out and hunt. Sad part is the, the farm I hunt. I mean, 20, 15, 16 out of the last 21 deer killed in the last three years has got CWD. So, I mean, you're talking 75, you know, 70, 75%. And if you're in Southwest Hardman or Southeast Fayette, I would bet those numbers, if you just could group them out like that, I bet you they're over 70%. I think Ames Plantation was around 76% on the buck, 60% on the does. So I, I think we need to, like Commissioner Cox said, I mean, I don't think we need to abandon that. That's... You know, it, that's my opinion, and that's not just mine. That's I've not talked to a single person that wants it to go back. So I wish y'all would reconsider that, and then you can look at those numbers. If you've got any questions about those, but it's just kind of comparing the CWD counties to the rest of, like, the top eight or 12 counties in the rest of the state, and it was pretty interesting. And I did that just to show a lot of the people in for our show that unit CWD, which y'all proved to, or the agency did, we, we never was slaughtering all our, those deer just because we could use those different weapons. So I appreciate y'all's time. Appreciate what y'all do. Thank you, Mr. Landreth. We appreciate your input. Anybody else from the public like to have any comments? Yes, sir. I'm 
I'm Roger McMullen from Atoka, Tennessee. I live in CWD. I live in CBD zone area unit. I have farms in Hardeman, Haywood, Tipton, and Shelby. I've talked to a bunch of people. I too have not had one person tell me they want to change it. I've had people tell me, well, I sold my muzzle loader. So now I gotta go buy another muzzle loader. And I feel like it's if y'all change it back the way it was, you're gonna lose a lot of respect from the hunters that's already confused on everything. I mean, it makes me think I got a farm in Grand Junction. I ain't killed a deer on it in three years. Well, is it really CWD or is it something else? You know, so what's, you know, it's all confusing to me. And late season is when we take kids out. Iowa has a late season till the end of January. Mississippi, it's a bunch of things it does. Even Illinois, I mean, late season is a good time to hunt. And I think we, if I was going to do anything, I would make it late season, season statewide because i mean it's a big opportunity for the kids to see a lot of deer well, that's all i got i thank y'all thank thanks for input there anybody else from the public okay uh yes sir commissioner right just one thing and that is i'd like to ask mark and the agency if you guys could compile uh, if your team could compile just some um data from unit cwd i'd like to see what fayette hardeman harvests did if we can tease those out just to see how it affected unit cwd because if those harvests are down they drag the whole cohort down and make us think that we're, we're not killing us. i don't know it'd be great to look at some of that data teased out for unit cwd and what the harvests have done yes sir yeah we can do that and i think we'll also get together some of the uh public comment stuff surrounding this and, and kind of have a whole picture of it tomorrow thank you Okay, anybody else from the public? If not, uh, Chairman Wright, thank you, you and your wildlife committee. It's, uh, as I stated in the beginning, these committees take this work very seriously and the information, and you can hear by the questions that uh, we're very good questions, and we appreciate the input from the public. And we certainly encourage the input between now and, and next month, and I think we're going to have an open comment period to uh, to staff. When, uh, Joe, where Joe? What's the act? Is it all the way up to the – week before the meeting what's the comment period exactly I had another slide, I had another slide. well <laughs> i'm gonna call you by your first two names then if you keep on i've got a slide here with the where folks can access um the the tool to give us input on these and and what the dates are we're probably going to open it tomorrow it's going to be open until april 10th um and while he's getting it up, I'll just say this. So the, the easiest way to get there is if you go to the agency's homepage. So there's the address up there. You can type that into your web browser, but it's a whole lot easier just to go to tnwildlife.org, which is our agency website. On that homepage, scroll down, and you'll see this big banner that says public notice comment period. Click on that, and there'll be a link there to provide input on, on the season recommendations for this year. Um, and then if folks want to, they can always email us. So our email address up there, um, twra.huntingcomments at tn.gov is where we can uh, receive emails related to these proposals. Thank you, Mark. And I'm sure Emily and her team will be putting this out on all our social media outlets to uh, really encourage the comment period between now and April 10th. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break and we have a couple more reports and uh, we'll be back at uh, Five of four. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Does Commissioner Little know the last guy sitting down gets fined? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a that's actually that's that's an I. All right, welcome back, everybody. We got a couple more things on the agenda, and we'll wrap up for the day. Um, I'd like to turn the meeting now over to uh, Commissioner Wally Childress, who serves as our chairman of the R three committee. Commissioner Childress, thank you, Chairman Granberry. I'd, I would like to turn the meeting over to Assistant Chief Matt McClary. Good evening. I mean, afternoon. What? Yeah, we're here. We're getting there. Good job. I'm proud of everybody. It's not as many in the crowd, but we're doing good. Thank you all, Commissioners. We'll make this quick. Hopefully, uh, just a real quick update about Buffalo Ridge. Um, it's not moving forward, Scott. There we go. Just a quick update for some of the new commissioners or commissioners that's here. Uh, the vision here at Buffalo Ridge, we want to be the premier outreach facility in the state. Uh, our mission is to educate people about the outdoors, obviously, hunting, fishing, shooting, and a little bit of boating. Uh, this is our rendition, obviously, of what the facility on the range side is going to look like. Uh, hopefully this next year or in a couple of years, possibly it's another rendition of that, uh, overlooking our fishing pond that's going to be constructed as well. So this is what I've been updated here as of, as just the last couple of weeks. Uh, the sign off from stream will be within the next couple of weeks. Project will go up for bid. There'll be a bid process of around 30 days. And then streams telling us that uh, contract can be in place to break ground August 1st. So fingers crossed that will happen this year uh, and we'll be looking at something within the next couple of years finished and ready to rock um so that's what we got any questions you don't have a budget figure on that do you yes i do uh we've got a budget on the the facility is about 5.3 and the ranges we've got about one point a little over a million dollars for the ranges left over commissioner davenport Thank you, Commissioner Childers. Can you just, uh, thank you so much. Can you give us just a, a narrative of what the facility is, just an update, you know, the inside, the function, things of that nature? I, say, I think the main reason is obviously going to be education. Have a nice good classroom in there. It's going to have all the multimedia that we need to do any kind of class that we can, that we can have, whether it be hunter education, boating safety, conservation education, obviously, and then any kind of shooting sports, we may have some training in there as well. There'll be some room for some office, you know, for, for our guys that staff it, uh, but uh, but mainly for education purposes. What about a fish fry pavilion? <laughs> we definitely will. I think we can implement that for sure. And, and if our fisheries guys get a good 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 uh, pond going out there, we could probably catch them anytime we want. So that's what we're hoping. What about uh, restroom facilities? Early on, there was a limited number. And they with a lot of kids out there, have we considered adding one or two farther out away from the main facility. I believe there is some plans for some bathrooms out out near the the range facility, the, the long range, and then also the uh, shotgun ranges as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other commissioners? Turn Thank it back over to you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Childress, and. R3 is a very important part of this organization, and we appreciate all the effort. Matt, we appreciate it. Um, anybody from the public would like to comment on Buffalo Ridge? Okay. So uh, I'd like to call Randy Husky to the mic to do an update on Stones River. Appreciate, sorry. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to present this proposal. Um, my name is Randy Husky. I'm the Hunter Education Administrator. And this is the Stones River Hunter Education Center and Range Budget Expansion Proposal. Mm -hmm. 
what we're requesting is $2.5 million. Now, this is el eligible for the 9010 federal aid match. So it would essentially be $250,000. The reason we're requesting this, if you look at the pictures, the range out there is approaching over 20 years old, close to 25 years old, and nothing's ever been done to the backstop. The berms have never been mined. They've never been repaired. So you can see the slough off of the range. It's, this is occurring on all three of our ranges, the front sides and the back sides. They're sloughing off. They're in, they're in really bad shape. <clears throat> so this is a proposal. This is what we're looking at trying to do. We're wanting to rework the rear berms and add rubber bullet trap. What this would consist of would be essentially a, a concrete berm in the rear with uh, rubber pellets in there to catch the bullets. Because um, like I mentioned earlier, this has never been mined. There's a lot of lead in there, which we can actually resell the lead and recoup some of the cost. So we will save a little bit of money there, but there's a lot of lead in those berms. And we're getting we're actually getting some a lot of bounce outs. They're hitting the, they're hitting the lead that's in, in the berm already and, and bouncing out. We want to rework the pistol berm as well. We want to remove the side berms, take these out, and add a concrete ballistic walls. And what this is going to do, hopefully, this will give us at least 10 extra shooting positions. So there's times at that range at Stones River that there's a waiting list. There's a waiting line, people waiting in line to shoot because this is our most popular hunter education center. We have a lot of people shoot here and it's very popular. So hopefully we'll decrease that burden and, and give the public much more opportunity to shoot. And that right, the that area in the middle right there, we're wanting to put in a steel challenge, which we know is going to be very popular. Um, kind of in that small area, we want to have about 10 lanes to do this steel challenge which is essentially a bunch of steel targets. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think shooters will really enjoy that. <clears throat> this is an artist rendition of the shooting range, what it will look like. Now this <laughs> came to us about, so I'm not sure that we can complete the whole thing with $2.5 million, but at least if we can get the concrete walls and increase our capacity, and rework, we rework the back berms. You know, even if we have to go back with dirt, if we can mine it and rework those berms, I think we can do that for sure for $2.5 million. Um, so we may have to forego the nice concrete berm with the ballistic pellets in there. We may not be able to do that. Um, but we may. It's Hopefully we will. We'll just have to see. Any questions? Mr. Childress, I'll turn it over to you. If nobody in the public has any comments, I'll turn it over to Mr. Childress for the commission. Any commissioners got a comment? Stan? With the current 9010 split, why would you not reevaluate the request and, and calculate what you would need to, to complete the project as you would like to? Well, I think we can surely do that. I mean, I mean it makes sense to me that you would reevaluate the cost because we know that it's gone up minimum of 25, if not 40. It, it, it has, but at the same time, if we can just get the berms in, in working condition, I, the, the concrete berms at the rear with the rubber pellets, that's kind of a, that's a really nice thing to have. It's not a necessary thing to have. If you kind of follow me, if we can get the increased capacity at the range and get those sidewalls built, and the berms we worked, that's gonna that's gonna make that range much more functional for us. We know the sport is growing. We know the demand is growing. Why don't we look more into the future to accomplish what we can now, knowing that that the cost is not going to go down? Now that's that's true. And that would be my observation. I don't know about the other commissioners, but if we're going to invest in the project, let's do it right. Uh, Bill. Uh, thank you. Um, Commissioner Bud. I think you have a valid point, but he said he wasn't sure whether he could do it or not. And with our budget constraints that we've got right now, if we, I, 
I think rather than going for two and a half and then go to three million or three and a half right now and going to the 10 percent off of that, I think we'd like to – I would suggest that we try to do it with this budget and and if we have to add some in two or three years uh, that we we might – it might be a little bit more palatable, but I think right now we need to hold a line on spending for is state it, dollars. It, is it not all PR funds? It is for ninety percent, but if you go to four four million or three and a half million, you go from two hundred fifty thousand to three hundred fifty thousand or four hundred thousand. And are we not concerned that PR funds might go away? No, I not not that I've I've never heard that. Now the director might have a better different opinion, but. I, I don't think the PR, I have no indication. Frank, do you have, is that a concern? So I didn't hear the question, but I, I think you're talking about how much PR is available for this is project. Is there a danger of the PR funds running out? Before yeah, we yes, fund there it? is. We, we're looking at this project as a way to use unobligated uh, PR, the, basically the, the basic Hunter Ed money. And we have, We've identified four million that's unobligated. This will be two and a half of that. And if there's other projects around the state that are, might be interested in coming online, I don't have any today. But if we put it all here, then we can't do work other places coming up. So that's a consideration. And I, I think it would be safe to to submit a, a project when we when we spend basic hunter ed money. We actually write a new grant with the Fish and Wildlife Service and they approve it for that amount. We can amend those grants as money becomes available. We'll regret, draw more money the next year. So uh, it, it is a, there is a finite amount of basic hunter ed money and two and a half million hits the four million that we know is unobligated pretty squarely. So you're comfortable with the two and a half I'm, I'm comfortable with the two and a half million and, and yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Granberry. Randy, you know, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, allocations to uh, Montgomery County. It was based off of a safety audit. I'm not sure who performed that. Did we do a safety audit here? We, we just underwent an audit, uh, federal aid audit. Is that the same thing, essentially? That, that, was a, that was not a safety audit. You know, there, there, it was a, it was a, a more of a, a program audit of who's using the range, how it's being funded. It was not a, they, they were qualified to do safety inspections. So who, who did our safety audit at Montgomery County? I'm not sure. I, we'll have to get back. Tim. Yeah. Tim turned on and had a crew, Mr. Chairman. I'll have to get back, but they had somebody come out and do that similar to what they did at Montgomery County, but. We'll have to get that and follow back up with you. I guess the point being is if you're going to spend this much money, let's let's spend it the right way. You, yeah. And this is in the budget proposal that Frank is going to bring. Uh -huh. And what we what he was talking about is the money that we use as support for other ranges across the state. We didn't want to allocate all those funds at one time and do this project in phases. So we get that hunter in allotment. We can come back and do the second phase at a later time. Thank you. Was there need, some discussion about lead mitigation, about more lead from the pickle range versus that of long distance? And has any evaluation been done as far as mitigation, as far as how much you could recover? Uh, well, I, I do know at Stones River that we, we have catch ponds. We have a, a nice drainage system that runs right along in front of the target line. And we monitor those ponds regularly, and there's never been an increase in lead deposited in those catch ponds at all. So pretty much the lead that's there is is staying in that berm. Uh, we've not had any leach off or, or lead moved from that site. So we've been lucky there. Now, when that group comes in that that does our berms, they're going to take that lead out of there. They're going to mine that lead for us. And, and like I said, they'll pay us back for, you know, so much per pound. It's not going to cover the cost of them redoing the berms, but it will offset some of that. So they're they're going to get that lead out of there, though. So that's going to be a non-issue, hopefully. <laughs> Any more commissioners? I guess it's all. Uh, Turn it back over here to Jimmy. Thank you, Commissioner Childress, and thank you for the work the R3 committee is doing. Randy, thank you for your presentation and uh i think we'll be covering some of that in uh the the budget uh
committee that uh, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Cox, who is the chairman of our budget committee, and uh, he'll take it from here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deputy Director Fiss with our budget expansions. Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, I'm presenting the budget expansions, and you might ask why, why now? Uh, why are we doing this? We have a, th this commission passed the budget for FY25 in August last year. And in that, in that time since then, we've had new opportunities given to us. We've gotten more uh, opportunity to spend federal dollars, which you'll hear about, and just, just other projects that have come along. And the reason we, we bring it now instead of, say, July 1 or later is it gives our staff time to get grants together that they, may, they need to write and execute before July 1 so they can hit the ground running in July. So that's why I'm bringing it now. We reviewed uh, all the proposals from staff, and they we were talking about uh, federal aid just a minute ago. We knew we had uh, PR money that we have available to us. We don't have similar funds in fisheries. So these are all wildlife fun, uh, funded, uh, Pittman Robertson funded programs, and there's endangered species projects in here. There's also some projects where we had outside uh, partners like uh, the Nature Conservancy provide funding or, or the Tallahassee Fund. So in total, there are, I'm gonna back up now. Yeah, in total, we've got we've got two sets of uh, funds that we're expanding. We have our wildlife fund and our boating fund. In the wildlife fund, there are 19 projects totaling $5.7 million. This, because there's most of this is 100% federally uh, funded because we have a matching partner. Some of these projects are reimbursed also by the wetland fund. So when you when you see the two different reimbursement systems in play at the at the end of the all total when all these projects are done we will actually have a, a gain of a little over a half million or half million dollars that we'll be able to put into reserve because we'll collect the federal funds and we'll collect we'll, we'll move our wetland funds over to the wildlife fund so again with all these projects were selected carefully to make sure we had low impact on the reserve in fact it helps the reserve in the boating fund we just had two projects a little over a million dollars and they're all federal funding through a yellow bass in here because it's fishing season keep thinking about that all right next what i'm going to do is go through all 19 projects just real real shallow dive into it if you have any questions we, we can talk more about them but i'll just give you my overview of them so we'll start with uh, this water control project on, on Gooch Unity. This is an example where we're using Pittman Robertson funds and getting wetland reimbursement. So that that, that is a, an easy one for us to fund. You just heard about the Stones River range expansion. That's basic hunter ed money that we're using to fund that. Like I said, we've got about 4 million that is unobligated at this time. And this two and a half is a safe use of that 4 million Next project is the uh, what we're, we're calling the Wildlife Academy, which is really the, the Tennessee Wildlife Federation's Hunt Fish Academy, which you'll hear about tomorrow. This is going to be a, a contract with them for two years. They provide the match, so there's no state dollars in this project. This is one of three projects that you're going to hear about that are multi-year projects. So when you improve this, this presentation tomorrow, uh, it, it will also imply approval for at least FY26, and we'll cover them beyond that in, in FY26. The next project is uh, our SWAP update, which is our state wildlife action plan, which we get uh, we get funding from the federal government for state wildlife action plans, and this is a 100% reimbursement to, to update that plan. The next project is a, a is a joint research project with a lot of uh, for a lot of aerial like flying species to track animals. Could be bats, could be anything. Uh, this is Pittman Robertson again wildlife uh, restoration funding, and it's also mat being completely matched by the Nature Conservancy. So again, no no state dollars involved there. 
On to uh, some work up at Buffalo Springs WMA. We have some work bases there. We're doing some office renovation. This is really just work-based renovation, getting some windows and electrical uh, to, to where it needs to be. That is going to be reimbursed by the Pitt and Robertson and the Wetland Fund. The next two projects I'm calling A and B, these uh, endangered species grants. We get a, we get endangered species money. We, we issue a variety of contracts to work on these sp specific species. And they come in fiscal year grants, which is a real headache for us to keep up with and report to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we got to keep them separate through our system. That's why I'm listing them separately here. Uh, next project is a fun one, uh, building bluebird boxes at high schools. We're going to use some of the Pittman Robertson money, but we can also take some money out of our uh, watchable wildlife, uh, the, the the license plate on the vehicles. So that's great use for that money, and that's where that's where that's going to come from. The uh, Talasi Fund is is the um, what is it Smoky Mountain Electric? When they did their FERC licensing years ago, they set up uh, their their mitigation for the work the for their existence there is that they pay for activities and management around that area. And each year we, we tell them how much money we, we've spent towards that and then they cut us a check. So this is money that they they have already given us and we just got to put it in our budget to spend it for FY25. All right, I'll move this along as well. This project, the first one here, is the West Tennessee River Basin Authority. They are giving us $100,000 to work on uh, propagation of aquatic species across the state, primarily mussels. The next project is a propagation facility that we have at Lillard's Mill on the Duck River. That These dollars are coming to us from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're dollars that they got for the Inflation uh, Reduction Act. That they, they reached out for states that had projects that were shovel ready and and our staff identified two that one at Lillard's Mill and another one to work on species at the Elk River. When going down to this one TNC, that's the Nature Conservancy. They are they are providing an additional one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to the Harms Mill project where uh, we are we and others are removing the dam at Harms Mill on the Elk River. Last project on here is a uh, joint project with the great uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Rough Grouse Society. We're, at, we're also able to use Pittman Robertson funds. So we're using our Pittman Robertson funds being matched by the, that partner organizations to develop early successional habitat on, on our lands. And our last set of wildlife fund projects we have a, a research study on the uh, OHV effects on wildlife. This is you know, how, how, do, how do wildlife react to the, the noises and disturbance of OHVs. Th this will be a project that is funded by Pittman Robertson and matched by Tennessee Tech University when this project gets going. The next one is uh, nuisance wildlife control by USDA. This is full state dollars. This not eligible for Pittman Robertson. This is a we're at we we have an ongoing account with them for animal animal control and we need to add ninety two thousand in this year and we'll probably carry it forward for a couple of years the same ninety two thousand not not additional ninety two thousand in the future years but we need to add more money to that uh, that budget so that we can pay our bills to to the USDA for that service. Next project is uh, various wetland habitat improvements on on our wmas this is a big one for us where we can use our pitt and robertson funds and use our wetland our wetland fund to pay for that so we'll we'll uh definitely be ahead on the reserve for this project and the last one is uh, a position that is cooperatively funded between uh, the twra and the rough grouse society where we put up the Pittman Robertson and they they cut a check for the 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 remaining the, the ten thousand of that is covered by the Rough Grouse Society. So that concludes the the nineteen wildlife fund projects. I'll do the boating ones. We can do questions at the end. I think.
There's just a couple voting quest, uh, funds. So each year we, we, we are allotted a set amount for the Clean Vessel Act where the, the Coast Guard gives us money to give to participants who want to keep the, our waters clean to do pump out stations. We anticipate having 900,000 for FY25. So that's why we want to put it in the budget. The, these are all matched on the ground. No, no state dollars involved. The next project is a U.S. Coast Guard big project, boating infrastructure grant, where we have an ongoing project with the city of Knoxville to, to basically build a dock for vessels that are passing through. This money is dedicated. That's exactly what these funds are supposed to be used for. We already have 200,000 budgeted, but the project has grown in costs. So we need another 200,000 to get it right. This 200,000 is going to let them complete the project, hopefully, in FY25. So to uh, to summarize here, give it give it some perspective. We're asking to increase the budget for FY25 in the wildlife side by 5.7 million, compared to what was approved at 133 million. It's about a four percent increase, but it's it, we are going to spend hopefully four percent more money, but it won't be four percent more state dollars. In fact. We're gonna we're gonna have be adding five hundred over five hundred thousand to the budget in state dollars by the time we get all our reimbursements back. To put the voting one in perspective, it's one point one out of eighteen million. It's a six percent increase to the budget, and there's no change in the in the reserve of state dollars associated with the voting fund. Other, that that concludes my presentation. Any questions? So no reduction in reserves for the boating expenditures no right. no sir okay yeah. uh, any of the commission have any questions of director fias anyone in the public have any questions are the budget committee i need a motion to approve or disapprove the budget this budget expansion so moved now here's motion and second any further discussion Budget committee only, but all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, it'll be recommended tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Chairman Cox. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Director S. Yes, sir. Can we get an update on uh, Real Foot uh, headquarters and what's been done? I didn't see that in the regular budget. I just wondered how that's going as far as the headquarters replacement or tornado blew it away. I'll give them that. We've cleaned that side up and then they're actually just going to do some additions to their shop, but we have not approved anything for those additions to their current shop right now. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any commissioners have any further comments uh, for the day? I'll just remind everybody dinner tonight is at 6 p.m. Breakfast tomorrow morning is at 7.30 and the full commission meeting is at 9 a.m. If I don't see any other comments, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We are adjourned.